Okay. One, two. OK, on va commencer dans une minute. Donc, euh, si vous pouvez euh, venir vous asseoir pour euh, le début du symposium. We'll start in one minute. You can come and take your seat. We'll start in, uh, in just a, one minute. All right. Good morning, everyone. Bon matin, tout le monde. Uh, on va commencer. Donc, bienvenue à tout le monde au Symposium IA Montréal. Merci d'être venu uh, en grand nombre. Thanks for coming to the Montreal AI Symposium. Um, je pense qu'on était plusieurs ici à avoir hâte qu'il y ait un événement comme ça qui a lieu à Montréal pour la communauté d'IA. Moi, je me rappelle, j'ai commencé à parler de ça, en fait, avec Nicolas Chapados. Quand, uh, j'ai annoncé que je revenais à Montréal, puis on s'échangeait des textos, on disait on devrait avoir un événement. Là. Il y a clairement quelque chose de spécial qui se passe à Montréal. Puis on a l'occasion d'avoir un, un événement pour la communauté émergente à Montréal de l'intelligence artificielle. Je uh, also remember when I was doing my PhD, I was working with Doina Precup, where we're trying to have these joint University of Montreal McGill seminars. I think many of us sort of had various visions of how to sort of create this joint community here. And, and this is kind of what this is as well, but on a much different scale now, which is pretty exciting. Um, so our goal really was to gather all the experts and professionals uh, in AI to discuss and exchange and develop <coughs> the uh, new advances in fundamental research and as well as applications of AI. I thought I'd give you a few numbers about the event. Uh, so it's over one day. Uh, we also stream live on YouTube right now, uh, hopefully, if everything goes well. Uh, the people in the back don't seem panicked, so I'm assuming it goes well, yeah. Uh, and so, so we say hi to all the folks that are watching us in Canada or around the globe right now. Um, we have two uh, keynote speakers we're really honored to have here, uh, Michael and, and Raquel. Uh, we took a bunch of contributions, uh, technical contributions from the community. Uh, from this, the program just selected two contributed talks you'll get to see today. Uh, we have also 60 poster presentations as well, so quite a bit of material. Uh, where we're very fortunate to have the support of 20 different sponsors, uh, without whom we, this event couldn't have happened, so uh, we're very, very fortunate to have their support. Uh, we have a bit over 300 people registered, um, which uh, We kind of expected, did not expect it to sell out in 18 hours, however. So that's how quickly people joined and, and decided to get involved in, in this event. So uh, part of the reason why we capped at around 300 is that we're on the university campus at Polytechnique de Montréal, who's done an amazing job trying to accommodate for our needs. Uh, but that does limit a little bit our capacity. I think we're stretching their comfort zone right now, in fact, with 300 people. So we really much appreciate that. Uh, but part of the idea of doing this on a campus, university campus, was so we can make this event entirely free so that anyone who wanted to participate uh, could, irrespective of uh, financial circumstances. Um, so, uh, je veux remercier tous nos commanditaires, en particulier au niveau Platine, uh, sans qui uh, on n'aurait pas pu faire cet événement. Uh, Ivado, Element AI, Facebook, Google, Microsoft, Maluba, Uh, Ubisoft, Montréal International, Imagia, Thales, Coveo, Samsung. On vous remercie, puis je, je pense qu'on devrait leur donner une bonne main d'applaudissements. Uh, 
Euh, je veux remercier également nos autres commanditaires au niveau argent puis euh, au niveau bronze. Euh, encore une fois, sans leur support, on n'aurait pas réussi à avoir cet événement. Donc, une autre médaille d'applaudissement pour nos autres commanditaires. I, I did not forget to put gold level sponsors. We had a gold level sponsorship level, but I somehow did the feat of designing and sponsorship level that was unanimously uninteresting to all companies. Uh, so um, sorry for that. Uh, hopefully the program chairs next year can do a better job. Um, but here it is. Uh, I also want to thank my co-program chairs, uh, Nicolas Chaparras from Elementae in Magia. Uh, Joël Pinot from McGill and Facebook, Adam Trishler from Microsoft Maluba, uh, who helped out selecting the program and putting this, this program we have today. So thank you for your help. Uh, and it was great working with you guys. Uh, also, thanks to the folks responsible for the local logistical aspects of this event, in particular, Guillaume Chiquan, our local chair, who led the charge in making this happen here today. Uh, Sandra Estrella did an amazing job coordinating with Polytechnic, so thank you a whole lot. I uh, also had uh, Geneviève Drouin, Carole Daigneault, and a bunch of other folks at Ivado and Polytechnic de Montréal, so thank you a lot. Um, I want to mention that part of the reason why we had all these different people involved from various institutions is that when I suggested we do this, it was really important that we have a bunch of people involved from various institutions to make it clear that this is an event that's for the whole community. And uh, we, this is also why I said that I would expect the next edition of this uh, symposium, because I hope we'll make this a yearly event, to be essentially owned by the Montreal Institute of Learning Algorithms, MILA, and it would be in charge of finding the next program chairs for future years. So that's really a community event. Um, so thanks in advance for MILA for making sure that this event continues for future years. So real quick, discussing a little bit our schedule. So after I'm done with this opening word, uh, we'll have our first keynote, Michael Bowling, um, then for about 40 minutes. Uh, and then we'll have two contributed presentations, each 20 minutes, uh, uh, with essentially 17 minutes of talks, maybe three minutes for questions, where you'll be able to go to the microphones to ask your questions. Uh, we'll have a coffee break where there will be coffee, I believe, at the two uh, exits uh, on this end and this end of this room here. Um, so you'll find coffee after for, at the break. Then three more contributed presentations and lunch, which will be on the first floor. Uh, lunch that's provided for free for the people who are registered. Um, now we're a lot of people, so that's a lot of people moving. So that means while we're resuming at 1.30, you might want to start going back up the sixth floor where we are a bit earlier than 1.30 p.m., uh, so maybe 1.20 or so, to make sure that uh, everyone gets here in time for our second keynote by Raquel Erdison from University of Toronto and Uber. Uh, then another two uh, presentations that are contributed. A coffee break where it will be time, a good time for sponsors to prepare their table for those that sponsored, as well as the poster presenters to set up their posters. We will be doing this at the first floor, where essentially in the area where we'll be having lunch. Then another three contributed presentations. Also, I have a little town hall meeting to give you guys a chance to give us some feedback as to how you think we could improve the event moving forward, or just in general discuss you know, the community here in, in Montreal and around, and, and how you know, maybe there are other events we might want to uh, uh, organize and so on. So just have a little open conversation between all of us in, in, in this community. And then finally, our uh, poster presentation session, as well as our Happy hour with our sponsors from 5 to, uh, five to 8. So, so that's our schedule for today. A pretty exciting day, I think. Uh, if you want more information about all the speakers, the posters that will be presented, you can go on symposiumiamareal.com or montrealaisymposium.com for all the details. And I guess that'll be it for me. So uh, bon symposium. I think we have an exciting day ahead of us. And uh, thank you for coming. Thanks.
first speaker. speaker. So yes, our first keynote is uh, Michael Bowling. He's at the University of Alberta. And uh, he is also now a senior scientist at uh, DeepMind. Um, Michael is known for various things. Uh, he's known for contributing to the arcade learning environment, which uh, was behind a lot of research has been done recently on deep reinforcement learning. Uh, from the bio that I read, he interestingly also have apparently some strong opinions about AI for curling, uh, which I'm looking forward to hear about at the happy hour. Uh, but I think more relevant to what he'll talk about today is also behind uh, DeepStack, which uh, is an AI for playing poker that beat a bunch of uh, professionals. So uh, let's uh, please join me in welcoming Michael. Thank you very much, Hugo. I'm really excited to be here today and to have been invited to, uh, to give a keynote address to, the, to the, the Montreal AI crowd. I think this is really exciting, uh, both for Montreal, to bring all of this uh, excitement together in one place around AI. I also think this is just exciting for Canada, just to see uh, how much recognition uh, finally maybe we're starting to get as to many of the advances uh, in AI that have, have originated out of Canada. Uh, I want to talk uh, to you about um, some uh, AI developments in the space of handling really complex problems like uh, poker. Um, I do want to recognize, first off, that there is a large team of people that I've had uh, uh, been very, very fortunate to be involved in over the last year to make this possible. And this success is largely due to them. Uh, I get to go around bragging about it, but it's really uh, their accomplishment and the 10 people uh, that were involved in this. Okay, so. Um, let, let, let me try to spend a little bit of time talking about um, poker at all. Like we've seen a lot of we've seen a lot of AI developments that have been first shown off in games. And let me let me say you might not have un, maybe you all get why this makes sense. But let me explain why this makes sense. Like you know you don't have to go back very far to think of you know great results of how we've been able to move AI forward through uh, uh, playing games such as. Um, you know the really complicated game of Go, but we can look a little bit further back. Like this is a this just keeps going back to where games have played an important role. So in 2007, for the first time, we solved a game that humans play. Like we know a perfect way to play the game of checkers, where we can play such that we can't lose, no matter how good uh, humans get at this game, and can think through it. Um, of course, we can go back to sort of iconic moment for AI, where we have Kasparov beating Deep Blue uh, at chess. This is not the first time, though, that we saw a computer defeating uh, a human at a game that humans play. That actually happened in 1994 with uh, Jonathan Schaefer's Chinook program that defeated Marion Tinsley. He had only lost like four times in 50 years of competition at checkers before, uh, before Chinook defeated him. Uh, but of course, you know, we've seen games, you know, super famous uh, result of TD Gammon playing in Backgammon, where we saw neural networks with reinforcement learning together. Now that's all the rage, but it happened 20 years ago. Uh, you know, but, but we can be old school about this, right? So, so the very beginning of computer science, where you have like the founders of computer science, both uh, Alan Turing and Claude Shannon wrote programs to play chess. And in fact, Alan Turing's program, there was no computer to run his program. So he had someone else you know, fake running the program so he could actually run a competition against humans. Uh, because at the very beginning of computing, we thought the power of computing was to leverage them to make intelligent decisions. And one of the places we often go to is games. But it isn't even, we can go further back than that, right? Before we even thought about computers, they're just gleams in people's eyes. We're starting to develop a theory of behavior, a theory of action. And we have like one of the seminal works in game theory, which is really thinking about strategic decision making. Uh, was really looking at games to derive a lot of that uh, uh, innovation and uh, inspiration. Uh, we can go back further than that. Like it really goes back to the very, very beginnings of anything computational, where Charles Babbage and Ada Lovelace, they, they actually dreamed of the analytic engine playing chess. They actually had designs for an automaton that would play tic-tac-toe. They were going to tour it around uh, England to make money to fund their research. Uh, they thought they could get their systems to actually help them win at uh, horse racing. And then they lost a lot of money. Uh, anyway, like from the very beginning, we thought computers could not only help make intelligent decisions, but the place that we would understand this is games. Now, this, this maybe feels a little bit funny, because we often think about games as the, the sort of the, the play things. They're things that like our kids do. But us, us adults 
and many of you are involved in industrial companies, you think, well, we do important problems. We solve the world's challenges and we do serious things. Um, so, so this seems to be a disconnect. Like many of the advances of AI, we can point to things in games where they were developed. And so, so why is this? And the reason this is true is partially why we actually think about games with our kids. Because as our kids are starting to develop what's going to be the intelligence that they use to solve serious problems, what are the skills they need? What, is, what are the skills that involved in intelligent decision making? And if we think about those skills and, and what you can get from games, there are things like early games teach you things like counting and numbers and colors and pattern matching and being able to put together you know, uh, these sort of just basic instructions of executing anything. Uh, now, as we move to more complex games, we have choices and we can realize that our choices have effects on the world. And we can plan for our choices to have certain effects on the world. We can start to think about these short-term effects and long-term uh, effects. And then we can start thinking strategically altogether, what sort of general positions do I want to find myself in in the game? And just being able to problem solve. If I want to do this, how do I achieve the steps to do that? And of course, games also involve many different players. And so they're always, almost always about some sort of sense of social skills, even if it's just trying to be uh, a gracious winner and not a poor loser. Or they could be cooperative, where we actually need to learn to cooperate to play games. And so when we, when we have our children and we put them at games, we're, we're sort of saying, you know what, here's a great proving ground for you to develop all of these skills before you go off into the real world and, and, and make, use these skills for other more serious challenges. Now, I want to talk about AI, but if we're going to build AI systems, then we're going, what kinds of things do we want our AI to be able to do? Well, we want it to be able to do all these things, right? We want it to be able to understand colors and numbers and pattern matching and be able to do planning over the effects of your actions and to be able to think strategically and cooperate with other players. And so we're going to need a proving ground for that AI too. And, and the reason this is a good proving ground for, for children is exactly the reason it's a great proving ground for our AI systems. And so it makes sense that we often go to games both for looking for crystallized versions of these challenges and to test out how far we've come along that front. Now, when I gave you that long history of AI and games uh, and, and computer science and games, almost every single, in fact, every single example I gave were games like these. They're games where all the information you need to make your decision is literally right there in front of you, often on a table on a board. Right? These are games that have a certain property. They're actually called uh, perfect information games. So these are games, again, where there isn't some other piece of information you wish you had that you don't have access to, that if you had that, your decision would be easy. Uh, this, all the information you need is right there in front of you. Now, this is a little bit weird because this definitely doesn't feel like the kinds of games that maybe the serious problems that we face are. This seems to be a rare place to be where all the information is readily available to you. And you don't have any uncertainty about, uh, about the state of the world. Uh, and this was even a rare thought for what, uh, for what real problems are like, too, even for the, the early pioneers of making strategic decision making. So, so John von Neumann has been quoted uh, in an interview saying, uh, when asked about, like, what is this game theory about, way back in the 40s, what is this game theory about? Is, are you like, talking about like, a theory for chess? And he said, well, no, like, real life isn't like chess. Real life consists of bluffing, of little tactics of deception, of asking yourself, what is the other man going to think I mean to do? And that is what games are about, in my theory. And so John von Neumann was thinking, as he was trying to develop a theory for strategic behavior, he was thinking about much more complex problems than these perfect information games. But he was actually also thinking about a game at the same time. And you can get that from the little hints that he's saying. I mean, he was thinking about poker. He was thinking about how do I develop a, a, an analysis of behavior? How can we think strategically about settings when I don't have all the information? When I can be deceived by someone else in the world who might know something I don't know, or I need to be deceptive in the world if I'm going to act and, and, and achieve my goals. And I know he was thinking about poker because when he wrote that 1940s seminal book on game theory and economic behavior, there's a whole chapter on poker and bluffing. Because that was a primary motivation, was to try to explain this. Is there a mathematics for these kinds of decision making? OK, so to understand uh, the, the rest of this talk, you don't need to really know anything about poker. I'm going to tell you everything you need to know, and it's going to be a small amount. Uh, if you don't really know anything about the game at all, the basic premise is you're going to be dealt a pair of cards or some number of cards. Uh, and then you're going to take turns betting sort of whose cards are better. 
Uh, but you don't know what the other player's cards are. And if you can either just sort of drop out of the hand if you don't want to match the bet, or if you do keep matching the bets, then eventually people are going to flip their cards over. And the person who's going to win is uh, the person who has the better hand. So you're just sort of betting whether you have the better hand, but you can actually pretend to not have the better hand. And you might win if they don't want to challenge you. So that's the premise of the game. Now there's ways the cards are revealed in other details, including how the betting goes. So one important distinction is whether you can actually make any size bet you want to, or whether you're restricted to make a specific size bet. And that's the difference between the limit game, is if you're restricted to make bets, and the no limit game, you can make any size bet you want to. This talk is going to be about the no limit game, but I'll mention the limit game at one point. Uh, at one more point in the talk, uh, Dr. von Neumann is going to appear on the screen for me to tell you one more thing about poker that you'll need to know. OK. So before we talk about how do we build AI for these complex problems, let me let me return to how do we build AI even for the traditional problems. How do we do AI in these sort of decision-making settings, even like the perfect information ones? And so I'm asking you to sort of hearken back to you took an undergraduate AI class, and maybe you had some assignment where you were asked to program something like an, I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm older than many of you, and I, I had to program a Connect4. I had to write a Connect4 program, but I don't think they do that anymore. People don't know what it is. I think you probably do Pac-Man. But maybe not. I don't know what the modern people do. But maybe you wrote a chess program. Who knows? But you probably wrote some program that's going to involve the algorithm I just want to really quickly remind you about. So how do I make decisions in uh, this sort of perfect information game like, like chess or, or, or uh, uh, Pac-Man? So, so one of the things I can do is I can start looking at the space of actions that I can take. Right? I can think of my immediate action, and then if it's a, assuming this is a, an adversarial game, I can think of I have an action, and then my opponent can take some action. And then I'm going to get to maybe act again, and then I can consider my action after that. And so I have this sort of tree of possible actions that myself and my opponent can take. And so I can just start to explore this tree. Right? Eventually, I'll, I, if I take enough actions, I'll get to the sort of end of the game. And then I'll know, did I win or did I not win? And then once I know that, I can back up that value of that sort of state to the previous decision. And if I'm about to act, of course I'm going to take a decision that should lead me to a win. I don't want to take a decision that leads me to a loss. If my opponent's acting, of course they're going to try to make me lose. And so I can start to back these values all the way back up to the very first decision I want to make. And if I can see a path that's going to lead to a value of a win, then I'll take that action. Make sense? Everyone, this, this is you know, mini-max search, alpha beta search, whatever you want to consider. Now, one problem with this is maybe the game's really big. Right? And I can't, I can't actually search to the end. Right? The, the explosion of the branching factor means I can't search to the end. So what do we do? Well, the standard traditional answer is, well, I'm not going to search to the end. I'm just going to cut off my search, some horizon in, some depth limit. And I'm going to reach some state now that's not the end of the game, but I, I don't have time to search any deeper. So what do I do? I, well, the answer is maybe I have some evaluation function. I'm going to take that state. It's not the end of the game. Uh, you know, it's, it's in the middle of the game, but I have some estimate from somewhere that maybe says this is a good position to be in, or this is a bad position to be in. And so I'm going to take that as if that's the end of the game, and that's the value of that position. And then I'm otherwise going to do the same thing. I'll just back those values up, assuming I'm going to try to reach good value positions, and my opponent's going to try to reach positions that are bad value. For me. OK, so this is, um, you know, just sort of depth limited heuristic search. Uh, now, when I actually finally act, I'm going to take some decision. Uh, then I finally get to act again. And now I'm just going to repeat that process again. I find myself in some new state of the game. And I'm going to repeat the exact same process again. But now I actually get to search a little bit deeper into the game because I'm further into the game to begin with. But there's another property which, about this, which is I actually forget even how I got here. That's not relevant. So, so I, I had this search from before that caused me to get here, that caused me to take that first action. I'm just going to forget all of that. And I'm just going to start my search again. Maybe I'll save some statistics from it. But in general, I don't need to remember anything about the path of how I got here. I can begin just figuring out what's the right thing to do here, independent of how I arrived. And again, I can have a value function that's a little bit deeper into the game. Maybe it's more accurate because of that. And again, I make my decision. And I keep this process where, again, when I'm act again, I'll forget what happened in the past. And I'll continue to search. OK, let me argue, this is like one of the most fundamental algorithms of AI in computer science. Right, this idea of heuristic search with a depth limit horizon and using an evaluation function, it's not only the underpinning to like Deep Blue and AlphaGo, it's like the fundamental algorithm behind those advances. It's like the fundamental algorithm behind reinforcement learning. Right? Like one of the basic premises of reinforcement learning is I can have a value function that's summarizing all my future rewards. 
So this very idea of just looking at a small amount and using value functions to summarize what will happen in the future is just a fundamental idea of AI. I mean, it's behind like robot path planning. It really is used absolutely everywhere. Now the crazy thing is this isn't what we do in poker at all. Like for, there's been 15 years of research and despite this being a fundamental algorithm that seems to be a hammer that we can use all over the place, we can't use it in poker. Well, I'm then going to show you that we can, but let me first explain why we didn't do it for 10 years. So what are the problems with this if we now switch to an imperfect information game? Where I now don't actually know all the details of the current state that I'm in. I don't know the other player's cards. And in fact, they don't know my cards. And that's both of those are equally important. So the first problem with this premise is, is exactly what I just said. I don't actually know what state I'm in. Right? So I can't actually begin to search if I'm not sure what cards the other player is holding. How am I supposed to figure out how they'll respond to my action? Because how they respond to my action will be determined by what cards they're holding. So I can't really begin to search just from the state I'm in because I'm not sure what state I'm in. I have another problem that there was a premise that I could forget what happened in the past. But I can't forget what happened in the past because that's actually telling me about what cards my opponent could be holding, which tells me about what state I'm in, and that's, I can't actually forget that information. There's something about that that I need to remember anyway. And lastly, we, we could take these states at the bottom that we were cutting off and we could say, let me evaluate those. But now, my evaluation of these sort of mid-game states, uh, I can't actually do it in isolation. I can't actually say how good is it to hold a pair of queens right now. I can't answer that question because it depends upon what distribution of cards the other player holds. But it depends upon more than that. It depends upon what does the other player think I hold. If I'm holding a pair of queens and my opponent probably thinks I don't have anything good at all, and a pair of queens isn't that bad, then I might win a lot of money. But if I'm holding a pair of queens and my opponent thinks I'm holding like a straight or a flush, which is an even better hand, then I'm probably not going to win that much money because he's probably going to fold to any bet that I make. So it matters what the other player believes and it matters what I believe about them in order to evaluate different positions. OK, so what is it that we did? Because there there's been a body of research on poker that's been running well over a decade, almost 20 years. And so the dominant paradigm for about 10 of those years was not to do that. Instead, we're actually going to try to consider the whole problem at once. So we are going to do what I said we didn't want to do, which is to say, let's actually not cut off the search. We have to consider all possible decisions that can be made all the way to the end of the game. And what we're going to do is, that problem is too big, so what we're going to do is we're going to make us, we're going to sort of sparsify it. We're going to choose a subset of the possible actions that, can, that players could take or that chance could take so that this game becomes much more sparse. And then I'm going to outright solve that game. Now this game is still hard, it's still an imperfect information game, and I don't have time to, to review sort of techniques that we can do to solve this, but, but there are like LP solutions that you could do. There's things better than that, but you could do this as a linear program. But you could just outright solve this computation uh, if the game is small enough. Now, the games we want to play aren't going to be small enough. The sparsification, or sometimes it's called an abstraction, is going to have to exist. So what happens then after I do solve this, and then somebody comes along and takes an action while I'm actually playing that isn't in my sparse set? So now I have a problem because I have no answer for how to respond to that. That's an action that I never even considered could happen. And it just took me, typically we would solve these games over weeks of computation. So I can't go back and say, hang on a minute, and then go run off and run some more weeks of computation, and then come back and say, okay, I'm ready to play. I have to answer something. And so the, the answer that we always did was we basically took that situation and we mapped it onto one we knew about. And we tried to say, well, we'll just pretend like that didn't happen. This other thing happened. I know what that means. I'm ready to go. Okay, so, so you bet. $50, I don't know what that means because I never solved for that, but I did solve for a, if you bet $100, so I'll just pretend like you bet $100 and I'm ready to go. Okay, so this notion of abstraction, um, it actually kind of worked and it kind of failed. So it kind of worked in that about 10 years ago, for example, we were able to beat humans uh, at heads up limit. So this is the smallest version of poker that people play and this abstraction had to do some work, but it didn't have to abstract too many states together. There weren't too much information sets, too much uh, decision points that we had to collapse together and pretend they were the same. And so this actually could work in that space. But limit is about the size of checkers and no limit is about the size of go. The amount that we would have to collapse together before we could solve the game outright of no limit is much, much bigger. And so we're running into problems with this idea as we tried to move to no limit. 
I want to try to illustrate what those problems look like, sort of measure just how bad those problems are. But to do that, I need to give you one more thing about poker, which is how do we even measure performance? Like, what does it mean? Like, often in, in chess and checkers and go, we'll usually talk about like win probability, like what's your percentage of wins? And that's easy to think about. Um, but for, for poker, the amount that you win by also matters. You're actually exchanging chips. And you want to not just win often, you want to win large amounts. Uh, and so the way we're going to measure that, because it, it, it sort of you could be playing for different stakes, you could be playing for pennies, you could be playing for dollars, is we'll sort of unify under this notion called a millibig blind per game. So for each hand that we're going to play, how many millibig blinds do you win? It doesn't matter if you have any idea what those words mean. Those are magical units as far as I'm concerned. So you could just leave them as magical units. But I do want to give you some scale context so you can understand, is that a big magical unit or is that a small magical unit? So, uh, so here's some numbers. If you were to always fold, you were to just not even bother looking at your cards, you were just going to fold your cards on every round, then you would be losing about 750 of these millibig blinds per game. You'd be losing exactly 750 millibig blinds per game. So, so, so that gives you some context that that would be an enormous number. Like we obviously have a strategy that can guarantee it doesn't lose more than that by just simply folding. If you were losing more than that, you should probably stop playing. Uh, a number that a, a, a professional player would like to be winning by in order to feel like they can be a professional at this game, they can be, succeed over the variance of the game itself, is about 50 millibig blinds. So that rate is considered a very healthy margin. It would be like 100 ELO in, uh, if you were to think of uh, chess or go terms. OK, so that gives you an idea of units. Let me tell you an experiment that we did about a year ago uh, that was looking at what are the best no limit programs and how bad are they? How badly could they be beat? So what we were trying to measure was if someone found the exploitation, if someone could play against them enough, they could find their hole and the mistakes they made, how much badly could they be beat by? Now we can't compute that exactly. The game's too big to, com to compute that exactly. But we can do a heuristic that gives you a lower bound on how badly they could be, be beat. This, is, uh, this beats them by trying to exploit certain kinds of flaws but fails to exploit all kinds of flaws. Uh, and, and what you can actually do is these three bars up here are, in fact, three programs that are state-of-the-art no-limit programs. Like the top two there actually were, top, were in the top three of the annual computer poker competition in 2016. And the third one here was actually the champion in 2014. So we actually took these programs and we actually played them where we ex specifically looked at how they played and built an exploit of how they played. Not by hand, it actually just sort of crunched through the numbers. And this is how badly that exploit can beat them. Remember, this is a lower bound. They're beatable by more than this. So, so remember, always fold is guaranteed not to lose by more than 750. And each of these programs are losing by four to five times that. Meaning that they have so much holes in how they play, they really should just, just fold all their cards. They don't understand the game at all any more than if they just put their cards down and said, I shouldn't play this game. This is insane. Now, abstraction, these are all used abstraction. That idea that I said could help you win at heads up limit, they're all using abstraction. That's where the problem comes from. There's two places abstraction could create a problem, though. You could be abstracting the card information, or you could be abstracting the betting information. We tried to tease that apart, and if we made it so that we, we, we made sure we did not try to exploit the, the, the betting information, then we were still able to beat them for about four times always full. We added a program that has perfect card information, but, doesn't, but now has to have betting abstraction because the game's too big. And it, too, was still beatable by three times always full. So really, the fact that you're doing abstraction and you're putting things together is the reason this is a problem. Let me just give you one more hint before I jump to the solution of how we're going to get around this. Let me give you one more hint. That what we've been doing for 10 years, if we tried to do that in chess, this is what it would look like. You would look at this big game and you say, that's really complex. There's like 10 to the 40. Uh, decision points in this game. I can't figure out what to do in all of them. So I know what I'll do. I'll compute a smaller version, a sparse version of this game that looks like this. <laughs> and uh, this is a small enough tree. I could probably just solve this. So I will. I'll just solve this. I know what to do in every single position that this game could ever be in. And now I come back and I say I'm ready to play chess. And I sit down and I stare at my first move and I think, what should I do? And I think, well, I know. This is what I would do in this game. So I don't know, I'll do that in this game. That's not even a legal move. Like, like, I don't even know what to do, right? I'm really trying to match just entirely different states together. 
And we thought that this was okay. And maybe it was okay when we were putting a small number of states together, but it's certainly not okay when we're putting whole universes together, which is what we had to do for no limit. Okay, the solution I want to talk to you about uh, was actually published in uh, March in Science. And the cool part about it is we're going to take that original algorithm and we're now going to make it work. I said there was three things that you couldn't do. I said you couldn't start searching from a particular state because you don't know what state you're in. I said you can't forget what happened in the past because it's really important. And you can't evaluate states in isolation. So we need to fix those three things. So here's what we're going to do. First, let's just imagine that we played part of the game. And we're now about to play. We're near the end of the game. So there's, there's only a small search tree left. So let's keep it a little bit simpler. But I have this problem that I played all the way to here. And I don't actually know what state I'm in yet. Right? I actually don't know, uh, again, what other, the other player's cards are. So, so in fact, I'm not going to do a search. I'm not going to do any sort of computation from a fixed spot, from a single spot. Instead, I'm actually going to make sure that I do my computation over a set of different possibilities. And in fact, that set corresponds to all the states I'm not certain whether we're in or not, and all the states that my opponent isn't certain we're in or not. We have to look over those joint states. So for poker, that corresponds to I have to consider all possible cards I could be holding and all possible cards my opponent could be holding. I have to think of both. Because now it matters, of course, that, that my opponent doesn't know what cards I have as well, too. OK, so, so, but then I have a problem. Like, how am I actually going to make this into like a, a, a little sub-game I can solve? I need to know what's the distribution over those starting states. Now, for myself, it's easy. I actually know how I played to get here. And as long as I think about how I would have, would I have played the same way if I was holding different cards, I can actually have the whole distribution over what my opponent could possibly know about my cards, given how I played so far. So in poker terms, that's often called my range. I actually know my range exactly. And so I can use that entering this subgame. But now I have my opponent's cards. You might think the natural thing to do is to just some plug in some distribution that my opponent could be holding right now. But I don't know how they're playing. And I need to play in such a way that motivates them to hold exactly the range I think they're holding. This is really tricky. It turns out that you don't actually want to have a distribution for the opponent. What you actually want to have is a set of values. And these values are actually measuring if my opponent, do, what would my opponent make if they had switched off and taken a particular pair of cards and decided, I'm just going to fold them earlier in the game. Or maybe I could have raised with these cards, even though I just called. And, I know what, and if you know what value they could have had, you're basically giving them a choice right at the beginning of this little subgame of opting out with that hand and going somewhere else with it. And so I actually sort of impute their distribution again every single time when I solve this subgame. The details of that are necessary for me to prove that we get a Nash equilibrium through this subgame solving. But the nice thing about it is there are a small summary. I don't actually need to think about all the things that happened before. I can summarize it in my distribution and values that my opponent could have gotten had they taken a different path. Once I have that, I can forget everything else that happened up to this point. OK, so that's step one. Step two, though, is that's great. But let's suppose I'm way earlier in the game. So now I still have this massive triangle underneath me, which is probably too big to solve. So even though I can summarize a little bit of history that's already happened, I still have this big solving problem. Now, of course, uh, we can forget things. but but now we want to do this trick. I don't want to look all the way to the end of the game. And we said before there's a problem with this, which is I can't evaluate individual states. So I'm not. What I'm going to do is I'm going to evaluate distributions over states. I need to evaluate what would have happened. If I, it's sort of one way to think about this. I need to evaluate what's going to happen when I run my subgame solver from these states. Right? I had this notion of, of a state now being over these beliefs. Uh, about what I could hold and what my opponent could hold, well, that's what I need to evaluate over. And this is how I can encode things like uh, it's good to hold good cards, but it's also good to hold good cards when my opponent doesn't know I'm holding good cards. And so I can encompass my beliefs about their cards and their beliefs about my cards because I'm going to build values over sets of states. And so given distributions over the sets of states, my value function takes a distribution, a set of beliefs over those sets of states, and returns values of finding myself uh, holding those cards in those states. And that's enough that I can back up the values. Now, this game is not a search game. It's still an imperfect information game, these little subgames. So I'm going to have to use imperfect information game methods. But we can now actually like, just focus on just that subset of the game without considering the whole broad stroke. Now, there's, there is some still more details that, uh, again, uh, uh, I take an action. My opponent takes an action. I'm going to redo the search again, just like in the perfect information case. 
There is some details about how do I get my range and counterfactual values to be updated for the new position. Um, I'm going to skip over that in the interest of time. But there is a, a, there is a closed form procedure that we can keep those up to date. OK. Um, all right, so, so what do we have? So we had imperfect information. We can do a depth limited search where we don't have to waste all of our computation seeing the whole problem. And we'll use a value function to summarize the future to keep it tractable. Uh, and now we have that same idea for imperfect information. We can search from a set of states and then we can uh, uh, summarize the past through just a small amount of information. Unfortunately, we can't forget the entire past, but that's just the nature of it. And then when we evaluate, we can again have a value function. It needs to be more complicated because it needs to be a value function over distributions, but we can still summarize the future in the same way. Now, this is cool because we have 50 years of knowing how to do perfect information really efficiently. We just figured this out. So there's all kinds of tricks that we can pull in from the perfect information world to make this better. And right off the bat, I just want to pull in one that we've sort of been really, you know, the, the community has been really excited by in the last uh, few years, which is where do these value functions come from? And we're going to get them from learning. And in fact, we're going to get them because these are going to be complicated value functions that we have to do this over beliefs. We're going to use deep learning because we need to really be able to have the representation power of a complicated function. Uh, and so our actual deep learning function for these value functions, the actual architecture, doesn't really make any advances on the deep learning front. It's a pretty straightforward. We just have seven fully connected uh, uh, linear uh, layers with a, a Prelu activation. There is one cute trick, which is that we know the values coming out of this have to be zero sum, and the deep net might not produce that. And so we can put a little gadget on the end that will force them back to zero sum, and we can still differentiate through that. But, but largely speaking, this is just pretty much a vanilla uh, uh, neural network. So we're going to train this by just feeding it random poker situations, random beliefs you could have about the opponent's cards and your cards, and then actually match it to the true values if you solve those subgames. OK, so that's the whole idea of deep stack. We're just going to do this continual resolving. We don't search to the end, and we use this neural network as our evaluation function. OK, so evaluation in this is actually tricky. Evaluating poker uh, programs. Are, are actually quite tricky. I, I mentioned one way to evaluate them is to do this exploitability calculation. Try to figure out how badly could they be beat in the worst case. Now I said we can't, we can't come to the exact value for that, but we can try to get a lower bound. We can try to see what we can do with, with some of these sort of local uh, optimization techniques. And uh, I showed you this result already, that the, these previous programs that use abstraction uh, can be beat very badly. We can run the same algorithm with DeepStack, and it can't find any exploitation in DeepStack. In fact, it's, it's limited ability to see the whole game actually means it loses a little bit to deep stack. OK, so that's promising that we, we can't find obvious holes. But typically, our go-to is let's just go play against humans. right? That's the typical answer of uh, how strong do we want to think things are. Like, here's like a prototypical you know, professional poker player. <laughs> uh, Phil Locke, he has 3.5 million in live play winnings. He has a World Series of Poker bracelet. He's your canonical professional poker player. Uh, to play against him, we have a slight problem that, that if we wanted to play against any player, it would take about 100,000 hands for you to get statistical significance on the result. This is insane, because 100,000 hands means that it's sort of like you basically have to pay their, their job for three weeks. You have to hire them for three weeks full time. Uh, and it's going to be hard on them, too, because they don't even typically play uh, you know, 10 hours of poker a day. Uh, there is something, again, that I can't go into details for. There's a new technique that we developed as part of this called AIVAT. AIVAT can actually look at the decisions being made and remove some of the luck that comes from the card deal and from the sampling of the, of, uh, the um, computer player strategy. And so we can actually, in an unbiased way, so it's entirely the same, uh, approximating entirely the same value, but it just has lower standard deviation of the result, such that about 3,000 hands of using AIVAT gives you about the same statistical power as 90,000 hands of, uh, of just looking at who's actually winning. So this is really cool because it now means I only need to play 3,000 hands against players and get sort of the equivalent about uh, 90,000. So that's what we did. This happened last November. We recruited about 33 poker players, uh, professional poker players. They played four, we gave them four weeks to play 3,000 hands. Um, and they could do it at their leisure um, online. Uh, and so this is, this is the results. So um, each of these dots here correspond to one of the poker players. Uh, they're, basically, if the dot is above this red line, it means DeepStack was beating them. You can actually see there's a very faint dotted line here that's sitting at that 50 number. So being above that means you, 
DeepStack was beating them by more than the margin that poker players, these poker players, would like to be winning by. DeepStack was, was, would be able to make a living playing against top professional players. Uh, now, not everybody actually played the 3,000 hands. Only about 10 people finished. A number of people, I think, just realized they didn't have time to actually, after they signed up, didn't have time to play. Other people, I think, actually realized they were getting their butt kicked and weren't going to have a shot at the prize money. Uh, and so they just dropped out. Um, if we actually look at the overall, take all the hands, we are winning by 486 millibig blinds per game. That's an astonishing number. That's 10 times more than a professional player hopes to win by. If we take the slightly biased view that, uh, th that we're adding some bias because we're dropping out hands that maybe people will actually quit early because they were losing. But if we just look at the players that finished, we get we still well over, uh, well over five or six times uh, what humans would want to win by. And where is Phil Locke, that canonical professional poker player? He was recruited in the pool, which is why I brought him up. He's sort of sitting in the middle of the pack of the people who finished. OK, one more, two more cool things about this, and, and then I'll wrap up. Uh, our previous programs used to spend weeks of computation time using thousands of CPUs to crunch through things. Because we're looking at a small chunk of the game, this now runs on a single GPU. It can run on a gaming laptop. And it takes actions about three seconds per every action it makes. They can play hands on average in seven seconds per action. This is faster than most of the humans are actually playing at, which is astonishing given the computing power we used to use to do this. The other fact is it's extremely flexible. This idea that we're doing most of our game theoretic thinking while we're playing means we can actually swap factors of the game. We can change the stack size, which is not normally something you can do with abstraction. You'd have to resolve like a three-week computation if you change the stack size. Because of that, you can do tournaments in ways that you couldn't do them before. So after we published a science article, we actually ran weekly, uh, for about eight weeks, we ran weekly live matches of deep stack play playing against poker players at freeze out tournaments, a format that computers had never played before, and we never even knew how to get them to play that. Our record in that was we won 14 matches and lost 14 matches, which you know, isn't so bad. But we can use the AI VAT on this as well, too. We don't just have to look at the outcome of one match. We can actually use AI VAT. And when we do that, and we just for luck, we were actually winning about 16.6 .6 matches to 11.4 losses, which is about 59% winning rate, which, which might seem like, oh, sure, but like AlphaGo wins 100% of the time. This is poker. There's actually a theoretical limit that you can't actually win at these tournaments more than a little over 60% of the time. So we're actually getting close to just beating them by as much as is theoretically possible. They're getting close to where they should just go all in on every hand because they're better off doing that than playing. OK, so um, that's sort of the summary I want to say. I'm going to turn it over to questions because I think I slightly went over. Sorry about that. Um, if you want to follow stuff that we're still doing with DeepStack, you can do that. And thank you very much. OK, we have about three minutes for questions. Uh, if you have some, there are two microphones in the alleys here. So just you know, go to the mics and ask your question. I'll get us started. Um, you've done phenomenally well at solving poker. And I'm curious to hear what you think, what pieces of the game can't we do well? What are the gaps yet? What are you going to do next? Yeah, so the, the one uh, sort of seemingly obvious gap, which I didn't even talk about here, is that the whole thing I talked about was all two player, by the way, right? And if you watch what gets played on television, you're seeing lots of people sitting around the table. I think if, I, if you would have asked me three years ago, how big of a gap is that? I would have said it's an astonishingly large gap. Like, I have no idea. We're never going to, like, we just don't even know what to do. Um, it's still true that theoretically, we don't have any idea what to do. The theory just all falls down when you go from two player to anything else, to, to more than two players. But we actually have, we're starting to develop a whole slew of evidence that these techniques, if you run them in, the, in a three player, six player game, they actually produce good strategies. And by that, I mean humans look at them and think they're reasonable. Humans look at them and then try to play according to them. Uh, so, so there's a lot of evidence that actually is saying that whatever these things are doing through this regret minimization procedure, they're still producing strategies that are actually quite reasonable. Now, it could also be that humans are terrible at this game, and so the bar is just that much lower that we've lost theory, but it doesn't matter because we're actually doing something halfway smart, and the humans are doing something really dumb. Uh, but, but that's the usual gap. The one other one uh, that, that I'll point out is opponent modeling, that this is all about approximating sort of optimal play, and we win because humans make mistakes. 
But if you actually know your hum the humans are going to make mistakes, maybe you should try to take advantage of them. This is something that good human players do when they sit down to play with bad human players. They actually try to take advantage of the bad human mistakes. And we don't have a good way of doing that very well that's at all data efficient. Uh, and so that's still an area that we don't know what to do with yet. Question on the right. Uh, specifically related to that, uh, opponent modeling um, and learning to exploit the, uh, the weaknesses of, of, of players um, based on their, their past history. Um, can you can you accumulate a, a data set of uh, of users' past history, like in public games, and then um, try to uh, improve their you know give them feedback um, and things like that? Like what what types of data sets do you need to, to do that? And can you? Yeah. So the one the one concrete thing I could say in that direction that we've actually done this was in the limit game about seven years ago was if you gave us. Uh, a pile of data of, say, you playing where I can see your cards. So it's not quite public data. I really need you to give it to me, because I need to know your perspective, because it's too much to try to figure out what cards you were holding when you folded. But if I could pull out data where I got to see your cards, so I could see exactly how you were playing, I can actually build a counter strategy to that. I can actually build something that's specifically designed to, take into a, to try to take advantage of whatever weaknesses you show. And what we found is we actually had some players play against that counter strategy. And one, it's effective. Like it actually can double the win rate that these programs were beating them by. But, and, and we only tested this very little. It would be nice to go back and, and revisit this. We think that it's the case that being able to really get clobbered by something, taking advantage of your holes, helps you find them faster. Uh, but I think, I, I think we only just saw a, a hint of that. We haven't really, like that needs to be studied much, much further. So if we really want to try to do something that's going to, like I think that's a really cool direction uh, I mean, it's true even for AlphaGo or any of these other systems. When we can build AI that can make these sort of superhuman reasoning, is there any way we can filter that back into some human advice, some human help that can make us make better decisions? I think that's a fabulous question. Thanks. We'll take one final question while the next speaker sets up. Yeah. Hi. So I'm interested in the generality of the insights that you've obtained by this exercise. How, how much of this generalizes to other games? And what is the rough distance of other games to, to this one? And does it, do the insights transfer to other domains right outside of games? And how, what is the relationship in the distances? Yeah, that, that could be a super long question, uh, a super long answer. So let me, uh, let me try to just give a quick summary. But, but if you're really excited, we should talk at a break or something like that. Um, so one is there is a rigorous theory behind all of this that we can actually prove that this is in fact doing the right thing for any game that you can represent in what's called extensive form, which is basically covers, there's a game tree and you're uncertain about which state you're in. Uh, there are some, um, you know, the, the theory sort of works, but there are some technical challenges that are, that are um, or advantages we took advantage of that are specific to poker, which is essentially the biggest one is that the thing you're uncertain about is what cards the other player holds. And in Texas Hold'em, the game that everyone's been looking at, there's only two cards the other player holds, which means you can actually enumerate all the things you're uncertain about. There's only about a thousand of them. Uh, if you were in a space where the things you needed, you were uncertain about, was too impossible to enumerate, then we have some challenges, and that's one of the things that we would like to go forward to be able to show this more general is to think about what happens when what you're uncertain over is not discrete and enumerable. Um, there are other applications that we've been playing around with, including security games. We've been looking at this as a model for robust decision making, and that's what I'd have to, we'd have to discuss this during the break if you're interested. Okay. Thank you very much. That was an amazing presentation. Thanks, Michael. So for the first uh, contributed talk of the day, I'm uh, very, very happy to welcome uh, Mark uh, Belmar to the podium. Mark is uh, joining Google Brain Montreal after uh, a stint at uh, DeepMind in London. And uh, today is going to uh, tell us about a distributional perspective on reinforcement learning. Thank you, Nicola. Um, well, that's right. So I was, this is actually work that I did with some of my colleagues at DeepMind earlier this year. I'm very happy to be able to present it to you today. Um, just to get started, maybe, uh, to start with the basics of reinforcement learning. So what's reinforcement learning about? Uh, quick show of hands, who's played this game before here? Enough people, right? OK, good. So imagine that you're the wheelbarrow, and you're sitting on Park Place. And now you're about to roll the dice. Um, and if you've ever played Monopoly before, you know that if your opponent is holding the hotels, that's actually a really bad situation to be in, right? 
And so in reinforcement learning, when we think of that saturation, what we're really trying to do is to sort of get a sense for how bad or how good a saturation is. And what that means in this case is we're going to look at all the possible outcomes and, and sort of assess how likely or unlikely they are to be. So in this case, let's keep things simple and say there's two possible outcomes. Either I'm going to roll um, badly and land on boardwalk, and that's going to cost me $2,000 in rent. Or I skip boardwalk, and then I get $200 from pass and go. Right? I'm, I'm sure many of you are familiar with that situation. So what that means in reinforcement learning terms is if we look at the expected reward, the average reward expected to, to get, then we could say, well, there's a slim chance that if I roll a 2, I'm going to get minus 2,000. And there's a fairly large chance, 35 out of 36, that I'm going to just get 200 times. Okay. And so the average that I should expect to actually get is 139 monopoly dollars. Okay. That's, if I repeated that process multiple times, that's how much I would get. OK, so what does that mean um, you know, in the context of reinforcement learning more generally? Well, we have not one interaction with the world, but if you're actually playing a game like Monopoly, you'll have multiple interactions and in fact, these interactions will be quantified or, or qualified by uh, what we call a policy, which is a way of choosing actions. So maybe you decide whether you're buying that property or you're not buying that property, um, or taking a card and not taking a card. And more, more importantly, there's not just one reward, but there's actually a sequence of rewards that we're going to see across the game. And we're going to discount each of these rewards by a discount factor between a gamma, between 0 and 1. Um, that's mostly to make things tractable. It's very, very convenient. So we always think of this, this discount factor. And now that's the object we have to deal with. Now what we do normally in reinforcement learning is we actually look at this whole sequence of rewards. And we call it the value function. We call it VPI. And we say the value function at the state x is actually the expected reward at that state plus the discounted next state value. So that's a very compact way of describing the, the whole interaction, the whole trajectory that we'll observe through a rollout of the game. OK, so now there's something funny going on in that equation. If you go back to the equation, in reality, what it's describing is a slightly different game, where you, you start in a state, and you make a choice. And then you observe, if you will, the mean outcome of that game. And I don't really have time to give you the, de the technical details for this, but take my word for it that it's, it's as if you were moving to an average state and receiving an average reward of $139. And then you repeat this mean process step after step. But the funny thing is you actually never observe that $139. It doesn't get realized anywhere, right? Um, so we had this insight a while ago, actually, three years ago, working with my colleague Joe Venus at DeepMind. We said, can we do something different? And this was a paper we called Compress and Control. It came out at AAAI in January 2015. And the idea was very simple, was to say this value function that's, that, that, that's described by Bellman's equation, we can write it down as it's just an expectation of a random variable z pi. And that random variable is actually the sum of all the things we'll see. But we can think of the, the whole thing as a single random variable. And what that means is maybe we can reason about that random variable. In the context of this work, what we did is we actually summed up the rewards, but we didn't use a discount factor, and we kept the horizon finite, so a time window of m time steps. This was to keep things tractable. Now, having decided on these facts, we sort of said, OK, we, we know how to do this. This is just a problem. We have one random variable, and we're going to learn about this random variable by doing what we call Monte Carlo estimation, where we're going to look at multiple trajectories of the same process. right? and then aggregate them and try to come up with a distribution. And actually, through repeated interactions with the world, try to map each state to its distribution of possible uh, what we call returns, so the sum of the rewards. And so this, this was actually quite successful. We played, uh, even back then, we played Atari games. Um, it learned quite fast. But it wasn't quite satisfying for two reasons. The first reason is that, as I said, we had to make some heavy assumptions on the kind of returns we were looking at. So this uh, undiscounted, finite, actually, finite reward space also. And we all know in reinforcement learning that Monte Carlo estimation is really the answer, because you have to wait until the very end of the trajectory, the very end of the game, 
before you get any information. And that's extreme, that has high variance, that's extremely noisy. Okay, so now what this talk is about is going back on this compression control idea and then looking at the Bellman equation. The Bellman equation says we have an expectation of this random variable on the left hand side, and it gets attached to two expectations, the reward and the discounted next state value on the right hand side. And what this talk is really about is just saying, let's remove the expectations. Let's just see, we remove them, and then we ask the question, what does that mean? What's the semantics of the equation once we've removed the expectations from it? Is there even semantics to that, to that equation? And the answer is, very surprisingly maybe, there are. Um, so let me start by talking about the fixed point of this, this equation. So what I'm going to show you here is the equivalent Bellman equation. I'm going to call it the distributional Bellman equation. And it's the equivalent uh, of Bellman's equation. But now notice how there's no expectations left. So I'm no longer looking at the mean process, but instead I'm looking at the whole distributions. And you shouldn't take my word for it that this is actually even meaningful, right? But the fact is you can actually write, if you write equal D in math, you're saying these two things are distributed the same. And that's a starting point. So we're saying we have a random variable z pi, which is distributed like a random reward r at the state x, and a random next state distribution, uh, which is also, everything is random now. And the discount factor gets multiplied. Well, it turns out that there is actually a solution to this equation. So it's called the fixed point, z pi. Uh, it will, there is a random variable whose distribution is as I've given it to you here. Okay. Here's what this means in picture. If you have a value distribution at a state x on the left-hand side, and you look at how it uh, transitions into two different states, two possible outcomes, that at each of these outcomes you'll have a different distribution. And what we're saying is there is a random variable which simultaneously captures all of these distributions in such a way that um, they're all sort of synchronized, if you will. All right? So with this in hand, knowing that there's actually a solution to that equation, we can start asking more questions. The next question for, for us, often in reinforcement learning, is is there a learning algorithm that we can think of that would get us to that fixed point? Okay. In this case, uh, we're going to call it an operator, which is just a way of describing uh, for lack of a better word, a mean process, although there's no averages involved here. Uh, but the distributional Bellman operator is going to look like this. Now, I'm, I'm going to add action to the mix, so let me tell you what this equation means. I'm saying if I'm going to start with a guess, z, about the distribution at every state, and from that state, every action I could take at that state. And I'm going to look at the consequences of taking that action, saying I, I receive a random reward, and again, and a random next state distribution. The only difference with the previous equation is that when we look at the operator, we're actually starting from a guess z about the distribution. It could be an arbitrary guess. And then we're going to apply this operator to try to get a better guess. Okay. And just to, get to give you a sense for where, um, what, the, what this operator is trying to say, it's saying as we're trying to learn about the distribution of these, these random returns, there's really going to be three sources of intrinsic randomness. The first one is the reward. So the reward is actually going to be random. Right? Maybe, maybe uh, I flip a coin and decide if I get a, a point or no point. Then the next state is also going to be random. This is like the monopoly example, where if I roll the dice right, I move to one state. If I, move, if I roll the dice differently, I move to a different state. And finally, there's a third source of randomness, which is my own guess about what the return should be like. So let me show this to you again in pictures. Let's suppose that there's only one next state. Okay. What that means is we start with p pi z, which is the next state distribution. And then we apply this discount factor, which is less than 1. We squash the whole distribution. And then finally, we add the reward to shift the whole distribution. So we start with the guess. And then we're going to transform our target distribution to obtain the distribution at a current time step. So that's the process by which this works. And actually, this kind of process isn't new to distributional reinforcement learning. It's been around for quite a while. In fact, it's typically what we think about when we look at expected reinforcement learning. 
What that means in this case, normally what we would say is we would say, looking at this process, we would say there's a contraction property, um, which simply means that if we apply the Bellman operator one step, we actually get closer to the solution. So the picture looks something like what's on the screen. I start with a Q0, repeatedly apply this operator, and I'm going to converge to, uh, to Q star or Q pi. Okay. So the question is, of course, do we have the same thing if we move to distributions? And on the surface, it might seem like that's the case. Mathematically, you actually have to do a bit of work to show this. One thing that's really, really cool is that to show that we have the same contraction property, we actually had to go and dig into the literature to read up on the Wasserstein distance. And if you're, if you're following machine learning these days, the Wasserstein distance is something that's becoming quite hot in machine learning. So it's really interesting to see so sort the of confluence of two different fields coming to the same realization that this kind of uh, idea is quite important. Um, and we can talk afterwards if you want to know more about where the Wasserstein fits in there. One thing I'll say, because if you, if you do machine learning, right, you know that normally we think, for example, of the KL divergence as a reasonable loss to target when you were minimizing, trying to predict something like a distribution. And the problem with the callback library divergence is that it, it can have, it can be infinite if the supports are disjoint. So we can't actually just use this. Uh, and the same way we can't use another metric called the total variation distance, which is often very frequently used, for the same kind of reasons. So there's something very special about the Wasserstein distance. Okay. Um, again, sort of very exciting to see that, that this shows up in reinforcement learning. All right, so that's, that's the math. Now the real question, of course, is does this work? Can you do anything with this in practice? And what I'm going to tell you about now is an algorithm called the C51 algorithm. But before I do, I actually want to start with the actual domain that we're going to be testing this on. And it turns out that this domain is the RK learning environment that uh, Michael Molling and I and uh, other people at the University of Alberta worked on a while ago. So if you, the, the RK learning environment is an interface to Atari 2600 video games. There's about, uh, right now, 60 games you can play in total. Um, and it's, it's probably one of the most commonly used benchmarks in, in reinforcement learning. Uh, because you get to play games, I guess, right? Um, so specifically, um, what I'm going to look at here is how can we do, of course, deep reinforcement learning. So have a deep network to give us those, uh, those value functions. So the deep Q network architecture that came out a few years ago does this by taking a ConfNet and outputting the, um, the value function, okay? And specifically, feed in not just one image, but actually four images, and, and look at the value of taking each of the joystick motions, right? With the idea that uh, we should be predicting the, the total score. All right, so what's the actual algorithm? It's very simple, we take DQN, and we're just going to replace the output, which is a value function, by probabilities, by, by basically an approximate distribution for each uh, action, okay? It looks something like this, we have for each, we feed in the image, and for each action, we're going to output a discrete distribution, which is our prediction about the actual value distribution um, that we're trying to get at. Okay. If you should remember one thing from this slide is that the learning update is distributions to distributions. So we're really not, we're not doing any sampling when we do the learning. We actually look at the whole next state distribution and back it up into the current state. And that's actually very, very important. Okay. So just to give you a sense for how the algorithm goes, um, we're going to start by sampling a transition. So we have a state and action. We sample a transition, observe a reward, a next state, the next action. And then we, we compute a target, as we always would do in reinforcement learning. And then there's this extra step of projecting into the support, which is the reason we can't use the KL divergence. And finally, we do a KL minimizing step. I, I don't have time to tell you more about this, but you should really be asking the question right now, why aren't we minimizing the Wasserstein distance directly? And you'll have to ask me afterwards. OK. So, does this work? It does. Actually, the first thing we did is we took this, this idea and found out that as you add more predictions, so you have a more and more refined distribution you're predicting, you get even better results. And actually, about 21 predictions or more, you start being significantly better than DQN. Okay? So much so that if you compare it to a slightly different algorithm, double DQN, which is even better than DQN, and you, you, you sort of plot the total improvement <coughs> over 57 games, where the improvement is on the y-axis, um, you see that for almost all the games, we're doing better, significantly better. Different way to put it, you, you can look at it as a table, and then you find that we actually have much higher scores than 
almost all of the state-of-the-art results. Okay. Uh, same thing, if we look at how fast we're learning, what we find is we can do better than DQN after 25% of the time on 75% of the games. So what I want to show you really is some videos of how this predictions, how these predictions look like. So on the first, uh, on the top half, you're going to see first a game of Pong. Let me start it now. You're the green paddle, and you're trying to prevent the orange paddle from scoring into your net, and you're trying to score. What you're seeing on the right-hand side is the value distribution predicted at every time step. So on the x-axis, you have the actual, all the possible returns that the network can predict. And on the, the y-axis is the probability of these returns. And what's really cool is that you'll see that around decision points, you have three colors. Um, each color is a separate action. And around decision points, you can clearly see that the predictions become very, very well separated. The agent knows that if it doesn't make the right choice, it's going to lose a point. And you see this in, in you know, it's very, very brief, right, because this is split-second decisions. Um, but this is happening. And you can tell that the agent has this sort of um, distribution over possible outcomes. Let me give you an, an example from uh, Space Invaders at the bottom. Um, Space Invaders is probably one of the most iconic games in the Atari suite, right? And it's an interesting example of what happens if you use value distributions instead of value functions. So in Space Invaders, you're trying to prevent the invaders from shooting you down and also, of course, invading. So if they get to the very bottom row, you lose the game immediately. Okay? And what's going to happen, you'll see it in a second, is as the invaders are coming down, there's a chance that they're going to manage to reach the very last row. And you see this happen in the, in the prediction that he's going to get zero return, which would mean the game is over, no more return. So you'll see it happen now. As the, as the agent becomes less and less confident, uh, it's going to now start predicting that something could go very, very wrong. So I think we'll see it here now. There we go. Um, so, so quite neat, right? All right. So just to summarize briefly, because I'm out of time, um, we started with this idea that we should do everything in the mean process, and we should always think of RL as a mean process. And it's really exciting to see that we can formalize and also write algorithms for dealing with a whole distributional case. And, and for me, this is really only just the beginning, because everything is still to be discovered. So on this note, well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mark. Uh, we have uh, a few minutes for questions while the next uh, speaker comes up. Joshua. Sure, sure. um, so this is really cool, but I'd like to understand better, maybe in intuitive terms, why you think uh, this brings an advantage against just uh, estimating the expected value of the return. So there's two answers to this. Um, we have a lot of hunches and no definitive answers. Um, I think it works really well, going back to this learning, this slide I, where I talked about distribution to distribution updates. My hunch is that the distribution to distribution update is actually adding a lot of stability to the process, and also even maybe preserving information that we would be losing in the mean process. So that example where there's two possible outcomes, lose or succeed, if you think about what's going to happen in a regular setting, you would collapse both of these into a single value. That's your average prediction. And you try to back up that average prediction back into another average prediction. In our setting, we're actually allowed to keep those two predictions completely separate and do the two backups completely separately, if you will. And I think that's where we're getting all the power from. So you're getting a better value function somehow that has less variance or something like that? That would be the hope. Now, I would love to give you a final answer. And the question is, I think there's a big prize waiting for somebody who can actually give the answer to that question. Thank you. Yes. Uh, yes, thank you. Mm, mm, very interesting. I have a, a question related to the previous Michael talk. So basically, if I understood it well, you finally, at the end in the algorithm, I have a, a, a fixed number of returns. This is fixed is one in this case. So if we tell the story again and think this is the, I mean, that the original Bremer equation was the distributional one, and we want to solve that, one way to do that is to collapse that and only have the expected value as an improvement, meaning we're changing the game here. And then, so basically what we're doing here is we're doing an, an abstraction uh, going into the direction of the more common Bemel equation. Then, then I wonder what, 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 is the, what is going on with the abstraction, because then in, in Michael's talk, 
he said at the beginning, where the he was saying before, that there was something that was being lost in the abstraction. And then he finally had this other result when, the, when the, he, he proved that actually the, 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 the sub game was being played, it was something. So on the what condition this is working, and what is the kind of abstraction you are actually getting? Because I understand that you, you have to find a, have a limited uh, number of returns. Right, so maybe if I understand correctly, you're saying there's, a, there's an abstraction when we just look at the mean process that isn't present once we look at the whole distribution. That's true, although I think the kind of abstractions that, um, that Mike was talking about were more at the level of states. So we, we still have a deep net, but you, you might be right that having less abstracted predictions, and this is maybe another answer for Joshua as well, is if we have more predictions, then we can train the deep net better as well, right, and shape those representations. Uh, so that may be an answer. All right, thank you very much. Okay, so if we can get uh, the computer set up correctly, next speaker will be uh, Ryan Lowe from uh, McGill University in OpenAI. Will uh, tell us about multi-agent actor critic for mixed co uh, cooperative competitive environments, and this is a joint work with uh, a lot of people from uh, Berkeley and OpenAI. Hi, um, my name is uh, Ryan Lowe, and uh, this is joint work with Yiwu, Aviv Tamar, uh, Jean Harb, Peter Biel, and Igor Mordach uh, through some combination of universities in OpenAI. Um, and what I'll be talking to you about today is some of the multi-agent work we've been doing. Um, that I started at OpenAI over the you know, past uh, seven months or so. And I guess the first question uh, well, the very first question, um, if you're not familiar with what a multi-agent system is, is essentially um, some environment where rather than having a single agent make decisions and take actions in the environment, you have um, several of these agents. And these agents are interacting with each other and um, making decisions. And this makes things um, slightly more complicated, um, as, as we'll see. Uh, and so one, one question you might ask is, well, why should we care about these kinds of environments? Why should we care about um, multi-agent systems? And um, I think there's, there's a couple of reasons. Uh, well, for, first of all, you can imagine that a lot of human behavioral complexity emerges because we have to deal with other humans, right? It's not just the fact that our environments are very complex. It's that we have to deal with um, other beings and other entities that are also um, reasoning um, on their own. Um, you can imagine that... Um, if you were to train agents in these kinds of, um, say, a competitive multi-agent environment, um, this kind of provides sort of a natural curriculum that, you know, as you, know, you, you start off where the agents are completely random and they're very bad at doing whatever they're supposed to be doing, and so there's a very easy direction for them to improve to beat this other, you know, crappy agent. Um, and then over time, as the agents learn and become very, very good and very skilled, um, there's still sort of a direction for improvement um, when the other agent is very good and you're also very good. Um, so that's, that's very appealing. Um, but the one that we're most interested in actually is um, using multi-agent environments to communicate in a grounded way. 
And what, what do we mean by that is use language to, to solve tasks in their environment. And um, to, to sort of illustrate um, sort of a quick example as to why um, that might be one way you could, uh, an attractive way you could learn language versus sort of the standard thing, which is to learn, um, you know, with supervised learning on, on big data sets. Um, picture the following scenario. So this is from the movie Arrival, um, which hopefully some, some people have seen. Um, and basically the premise is that aliens come to Earth and instead of, you know, sort of blowing everyone up, they decide that um, they want to try to communicate with the humans, which is great. And so the humans send, you know, their little party to this, you know, cavern. Um, and, and the question I want to ask you is, um, given, uh, you know, say, say you were chosen to communicate with these aliens, um, if you only had the ability to listen to what the aliens were saying, um, and you're sort of in a dark room with no other sort of sensory stimulation, would you be able to uh, pick up the alien language, even after a very long time of simply listening to them talk? And I would maintain that the answer is, um, at the very least, that, that would not be the most efficient way to learn the language, um, if, if you could learn it at all. And presumably, a better way to do it would be to um, have some kind of uh, gr what's called grounding in linguistics. So basically, the idea that various um, concepts and words are tied to um, you know, objects and um, actions in our, in our environment. Um, and so the way we sort of view language in this work is um, that an agent understands language if it's able to use language to solve problems in its environment. Um, and another nice thing um, about you know, taking this view is that it's easy to measure performance on a certain task that requires communication. Um, and of course, this is not, we're not the first people to think of this. There's a lot of related work um, along this vein. So, you know, sort of painting this sort of grand picture of, you know, language, pragmatic language use in multi-agent systems, um, the, I'll sort of spoil it a bit that we, uh, the, the sort of short story of this work is that um, doing this with reinforcement learning is, is, is hard, or seems to be very hard. And um, it, we're sort of taking a small step here to solve some of the very simplest communication tasks. And when we first tried to apply reinforcement learning to these kinds of problems, um, even in a simple environment like this one where um, you sort of have these agents as particles that can um, you know, say things and move around and you know, maybe you can have them look places. Um, the, the naive way to apply reinforcement learning to this problem is what's called um, independent or uh, decentralized um, RL, which basically means that each agent is a reinforcement learning agent um, that is completely separate from every other agent in the environment. And there's no um, function or no unifying um, way for them to, to interact with each other. Now, you know, when we were starting this work, we were, you know, apprehensive of the fact that reinforcement learning doesn't always work the very first time you try it, um, as, as some people here are, are most likely aware. Um, and so, so what we decided to do was to look at the simplest possible communication task that we could, that we could imagine, which is basically you have two agents. You have a sort of gray agent here that's the uh, speaker agent, and you have this light green agent that's the listener agent. And there are three sort of fixed landmarks. There's a green one, a red one, and a blue one. And the goal of the listener agent, in fact, the goal of both agents, because it's a cooperative uh, game in this case, is for the green agent, or sort of whatever color the agent is, is to go to a specific color landmark. So in this case, um, the agent wants to go to the green landmark. Um, but at each episode, the color that the agent has to go to is randomly initialized. And the catch is that the listener does not know which landmark it has to go to, but the speaker does. So the speaker has to say some word that means a certain color for the listener to go to, and then the listener has to go uh, to that landmark. And the reward is basically how far the listener is away from the landmark. So this is very, um, very straightforward. Um, but it turns out that if you try using decentralized reinforcement learning methods, um, it essentially, uh, well, I mean, it doesn't work at all. 
Um, and you can see what's sort of happening here is that the, the speaker ends up always saying the same thing. Uh, and the listener learns to ignore the speaker because it's not saying anything useful and just goes to the middle of the landmarks in, or, in order to, um, to maximize its reward. Uh, and this was slightly discouraging for us. Um, and so we sort of said, okay, you know, the first thing we have to be able to do is solve um, a task like this. Because this is, um, you know, something obviously we would like to be able to solve. Um, and I should, I should say that um, in almost, for, for most of the reinforcement learning algorithms we tried, um, it simply doesn't work at all. But for some um, algorithms, it does end up working eventually, but it takes a very, very uh, long time, and it's not very consistent either. Um, and you know, the question to ask is, why, uh, why does this happen? And I guess the, the short version is that when you have these two agents that are um, working in this environment, they need to settle on some communication protocol. Um, and you know, if, if, say, the speaker agent says one word, um, that's you know, the right thing to say, but the listener um, interprets it, or sorry, moves in the wrong direction and interprets it the wrong way, then it'll get negatively reinforced, even though um, that might have been a good thing for the speaker to say and vice versa. Um, so somehow there's this problem of settling on a, on a joint communication protocol. Um, and you know, another way to say that is that each agent's reward depends on the actions of all of the other agents in the environment. And if you're only considering your own actions, that sort of reward is going to have very high variability. So um, what we would want to do is have some way to um, reduce that variance. Um, and we, in fact, um, thought of a very, very simple way of doing that, um, which is using an extension of actor-critic reinforcement learning methods. So what, is, what are actor-critic methods? Um, essentially, I should have had an explaining slide a little bit, but um, when Michael earlier was talking about um, you know, having some, some value function that you're trying to use to estimate the future reward you're going to get, um, a, a, a critic is basically some um, function approximator you use to approximate how uh, that value, exactly. Um, and actor critic methods basically um, have explicit representations of both um, <laughs> The actor, which is the policy that is uh, performing actions in the environment, and this critic that estimates um, how good the, the value is. Um, so now we essentially just take a very simple extension to this idea, where you extend the critic for each agent to consider not only each agent's individual actions, but also the observations and actions of all the other agents. Um, and the intuition for why this might be a sensible thing to do is that um, essentially you are conditioning um, now your, your gradient updates on um, the actions of other agents and you basically are removing some source of variability in the reward. Um, and there's a few other reasons why this is maybe a good idea. Um, the, the, the way I guess we implement it in this case is um, through an extension of what's called the DDPG algorithm. Uh, but really, this, this idea is applicable to sort of any kind of um, actor-critic method. And this is kind of a nice sort of visual illustration of what's going on. So you have um, n actors, and um, they each get observations from the environment, and they produce actions. And uh, so these are all sort of operating independently. And now, um, what you have at the bottom are these critics that take in these um, observation action pairs. And what's, it's important to note that there is still a separate critic for each agent, and that will be important later, um, versus having sort of a single critic for all agents. And the reason why that's important is that if you want to have competitive environments where agents are competing against each other with opposing reward functions, then, then having a centralized a single critic uh, doesn't make sense because um, well, it's supposed to estimate the future reward. And if the reward is different for different agents, then that doesn't really make sense anymore. So you really want to um, keep it so that there's a separate critic for each agent. Um, just that you're augmenting this critic with extra information. And another very important point is that 
Um, the reason, so you might imagine, you know, okay, if, why, why have this sort of centralized critic business? Why not just have, um, you know, full centralization where you just have a single policy that does everything? Um, and well, first of all, the answer is that, um, you know, then the concept of, you know, communication and learning, you know, a, a language um, is a bit fuzzier, especially if we want sort of discrete language. Um, but importantly, with, with this sort of setup, what you can do is that um, during training time, these critics are present to basically help you learn. That's, uh, that's the way to think of what the critic is doing. But at test time, what you do is you sort of wipe away the critics and you just let these agents um, run their policies in their environment. So actually at execution time, you don't need um, any sort of centralization, um, which, is, which is important. Now there's a couple um, additions to this that we, that we sort of thought up for the paper. Um, and, and basically these are um, slightly related, but um, different ideas that, that we found experimentally to lead to improvements um, in the kinds of environments that we were looking at. So the first idea is to simply, um, instead of training an agent with a single policy, you train agents with some collection or some set of policies. And at each episode, you simply sample a policy from that agent, and then um, you run that in the environment, um, and then um, see what happens. Uh, and the reason why this makes sense is that, um, well, in competitive environments, it's easy to overfit to the behavior of the other agent. And so this basically ensures that if you have to face sort of some collection of agents rather than a single agent, um, then you know, you, your, your policy might be a bit more robust. And we see that experimentally. And I don't quite have time to go into the, the second idea. Um, but I'd like to sort of skip ahead to the, the experiments. And how we test these is essentially these kind of particle world environments where, um, like I mentioned before and showed before, um, you have some agents and you have some landmarks and there's some kind of basic physics that's going on. Um, and these are sort of four examples of the environments that we, that, we, um, that we test on. So on the far left, there's that, uh, what we call the cooperative communication environment that I showed before. Uh, we have a predator-prey environment where the red uh, predators chase the green prey. Um, we have a sort of navigation environment where um, agents have to sort of cover all of the, of the bases, but they're very big and have to avoid colliding with each other, so that requires some coordination. And one of my favorite environments is the one on the far right, which is basically, um, well, it's called the physical deception environment. I think, I think it will make more sense if I, if I show the, the video, so I'll, I'll put that on hold a bit. And what we see is essentially that by centralizing this critic, we are able to very reliably solve um, these kinds of uh, simple communication problems uh, that we weren't able to solve before. Um, and so you can see the green agent is correctly going to the, the green landmark. Um, and you know, if you look at the curves, you can see that you know, we learn significantly faster. Um, and also, the other methods all sort of kind of have this plateau around negative. 30 or so, which is the reward you get if you um, simply go to the middle of all the landmarks. Uh, but you know, th sort of at the end, there's a bit, a bit of promise maybe um, for, I think it's the, the PPO algorithm. Um, the physical deception environment is very interesting. So in this environment, essentially, you have um, two blue agents that are the good agents and a red agent that's the sort of adversarial agent. And the goal of the, of the blue agents is to um, have one of them cover the green landmark um, but prevent the red agent from, from reaching the green landmark. And, and the catch is that the red agent sees everything except it doesn't know which of the landmarks is the green landmark. So what the agents have to learn to do is they have to learn to split up um, so that the red agent is confused. Uh, and you can see that in the, in the uh, centralized critic case, which is the middle one, um, they learn this very nice behavior. And uh, if they don't have this centralized critic behavior, they shoot off into space uh, sometimes. It's, it's, uh, yeah, it's not great. Uh, we also have um, kind of interesting sort of cryptography environment um, where essentially you have um, Alice sending some um, short message to Bob um, and that Bob has to get some reward based on um, how well it's able to reconstruct that message. But simultaneously, um, you have this eavesdropper, Eve, who um, is also trying to reconstruct the message. Uh, and so basically what Alice has to do is encrypt it with some private key that's known to both Alice and Bob. And so you can, you can run this with multi-agent reinforcement learning. And what you get is that 
Um, if you have a centralized critic, uh, the, the success rate, the, the delta success rate um, between Alice and Bob and Eve is, is very high. Um, and so sort of the way we evaluate these competitive environments is by essentially pitting each combination of um, algorithms against each other. So um, you see how the centralized critic performs against other centralized critic algorithms. Um, and then MADDPG versus um, DDPG when DDPG is Eve and um, sort of all those four combinations. Um, and really when, when MADDPG is, um, is Alice and Bob and Eve is DDPG, um, it, it really uh, gets stomped. And this is sort of what this looks like pictographically, um, pitting all these combinations of algorithms against each other. Against each other. Um, and I was, I was asked for, for an OpenAI blog post to sort of make something that looked more complicated. Uh, and, so, and so this is what I, what I did. It's basically, anyway, there's a lot of elements to it, but there's some partial observability, there's some communication involved. Um, the, the takeaway is like, look in the middle, the agents are kind of doing sensible things. Look on the right, they're just kind of standing around and not doing much. Um, and I think I'm basically out of time, but in terms of next, ste next steps, what I'd like to do is, um, of course, basically the entire question that I posed at the beginning um, remains unsolved. Um, so, so there's still the question of um, how do we get agents that exhibit complicated behavior and interesting communication protocols? Um, but there's also the second question of um, how can we transfer that to um, solving tasks and communicating in human language? Um, and, and that remains a very open problem. Um, and that's uh, one thing that I'd like to work on. Uh, and these are my collaborators. Um, and that's all. Thank you very much. So we have time for a few questions before we break for, for coffee. Please go to the microphone. Thanks for the talk, Ivik. Um, I was curious what you think about the importance of the complexity of the environment. Mm -hmm. Like you mentioned that this is a simple task, but it, 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 from your motivating slide about multi-agent RL, it seems like part of the cool part about that is that you have this non-stationarity of the environment and the, like a complexity of the environment given by having other agents be part of the environment. And I was wondering if it might also be important to have not a you know grid world or yeah. point world. Yeah, um, that's a great question. I think it's very clear that um, environmental complexities can be very important. I think what will be required is some kind of way um, or some kind of set of objects in your environment that agents can manipulate, even if it's even if they don't look sort of graphically complex. Um, objects where you can sort of combine them together to make new objects or you know, some of these objects being you know, resources that have to be consumed, um, and objects with some kind of interesting combinatorial behavior. Um, I think that, I mean, because that's sort of um, you know, what humans have um, in, in, our, in our world. So I think if there's definitely um, a limit to, you know, given the complexity of the environment, there's only so far these agents can, you know, so, much, so many things these agents can learn. Um, so I think it's very important, basically, yeah. Any other question? Olivier? So in your examples, it seems like you always had some agents cooperating with each other, maybe against an adversary. Just to be sure, would the technique also work in a purely adversary setting, just knowing what the agent, the other agent, uh, is doing? Yeah, it would work in um, purely competitive settings as well, yeah. Um, yeah. Last one, Chris. So in Dhruv Batra's work, he's found that you have to pre-train the language model, yeah. uh, and that if you don't do things like this, sometimes the agents start to cheat, and they learn to communicate information. Have you come across these kinds of issues? Um, so there's a couple of uh, Drew Batcher's work. I guess you're talking about the negotiation one. The uh, there's a, there's a follow-up one to that. Were there uh, the 
Uh, RL communication agents for uh, natural uh, natural language does not emerge naturally. Sure. Uh, yeah, that, that, one. that one. That one. Okay. That's a good one. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, um, so yeah. So I, I think in that paper, what they're trying to obtain is um, some kind of compositionality. So some kind of compositional language. And yeah, exactly. What they find is that um, if you sort of naively um, run these kinds of settings, and they have a simple reference game that they run, um, that compositional language, which is sort of exactly how um, most human languages are formed, um, don't, doesn't emerge. Um, they need all these hacks to get compositional language. But uh, so actually, that's something we're working on now is, uh, so in this case, I should say that no compositional language is, is necessary to actually solve any of these tasks. Um, but that's something we're looking into. And what I've sort of found is that um, if you, the way they set up their problem um, is, makes it very difficult to train if you increase the number of, of objects in their reference game. Um, so if you increase it from, say, four to six, then it just doesn't train. Um, so I, and I think getting some kind of compositional language, um, to do that, you need a world where you have lots of objects to, you know, um, to learn about. Um, so that's, I think scaling that up is, is another project that we're interested in. Great, so let's uh, thank uh, Ryan again. Okay, we now, we now break for coffee back at 11 sharp. Uh, if you speak during the next session, please come and test your laptop uh, during the break to make sure that everything is smooth. Thank you.
please have a seat. Okay, so welcome back. We're going to get started again. I'm uh, really happy to introduce uh, the next contributed talk um, by Norm Ferns from Sport Logic, uh, who will tell us about team sports modeling. Norm. Hi, everyone. Uh, hi, Hadrian. Daddy loves you. So, first of all, I just want to thank the organizers for putting this together. It's a real pleasure to be here with you today, to be able to share something with you that I find interesting, and, and hopefully something you'll find interesting, too. Uh, secondly, I need to mention that I am presenting on behalf of my wonderful colleagues at SportLogic. Honestly, if you happen to see anything cool in the slides that follow, all credit has to go to them. Thirdly, in contrast to the previous talks, I have the most wonderful job in the world because I'm not going to show you any real solution methods. I'm just going to take you on a tour of some wonderful problems and ask you to solve them for me. Okay? So keep that in mind. Now, let's talk about team sports modeling. Team sports is an area that I find interesting because it's something we're all familiar with. And while the problems that arise are pretty easy to describe, they're not so easy to solve. For example, how would you assess the performance of the participants in a team sport? Now, if you look at the top of the slides, you'll see two guys there, two hockey players. We're in Montreal. We've got to talk hockey. Right? If you're not familiar with them, on the left, you have Shea Weber, and on the right, you have P.K. Subban. And these guys, just over a year ago, were involved in a pretty contentious trade between the respective teams. They both play the same defensive position within their team. So you might think, hey, it shouldn't be too hard to compare them. But quite frankly, that's not the case. And even today, more than a year later, pundits are still taking every position under the sun as to whether or not that was a good trade. How would you analyze that? How would you assess and compare the performance? Well, if it was up to me, first thing I would do would be to run out and go and collect some data. How do you collect data? Well, believe it or not, today, some of the big sports leagues still do it the old-fashioned way. They, they actually have experts and fans run out to the arenas, sit in the stadium, watch the game, take notes. Even if you have your best experts able to attend every single game in every stadium, you still have to question the quality and the quantity of the data that you would have to get. But hey, these are big sports leagues. They've got money, right? So why don't they just go and buy all sorts of cool tracking chips and place it on everything? Place it on the players, place it on the refs, place it on the pucks, place it on the sticks, record gestures, put in all sorts of fancy cameras in the stadiums, record anything you could possibly imagine. Again, it's just not feasible. Just installing such specialized hardware is going to be very, very expensive. And if you look into maintaining it, maintaining it, considering these are contact sports and they're going to be jarred and you have to take them down precision, you know, these big leagues have money, but they don't have that much money. And if you're at the amateur level, well, forget about it. You can't use any sort of procedures uh, that would come out from that to collect your data. Even if you had perfect data collection, the problem was still hard because there's no unambiguous ground truth uh, for inference. If you have a goalie that you think is good or is seen to be good, is she seen to be good because she's really particularly skilled? Or is she seen to be good because she has really good teammates who are good at shutting down the dangerous shots that she might face? So these are the sorts of questions that we want to uh, look into and answer. How do you adequately collect data? 
and how do you properly interpret that? Uh, more importantly, can we automatically generate robust, useful team sports insights from partial observations? Now, in what follows, you might think that the answer is going to be obviously last yes. And if you do, I want you to keep in mind, can you do something in real time? Because in sports, what really matters is what's happening right now. Okay? Uh, over the next few minutes, uh, I just want to take you into a tour of some problems. As I said, we're just going to go over some basic terminology for team invasion sports. I want to frame the data acquisition problem as a series of computer vision problems and frame the game modeling as a series of machine learning problems. Now, really, the distinction between the two is somewhat artificial because modern computer vision really intersects a lot with modern uh, machine learning. Uh, but for our purposes, you can think of the problems that are working with learning something from low-level pixel-type data as the computer vision side and any sort of inference from higher level features is the machine learning side. So what's a team invasion sport? It's a sport like ice hockey, soccer, netball, pretty common in the Commonwealth. Not figure skating or baseball or cricket. What's the difference between these two categories? Uh, well, the team invasion sport category has the following common structure. You have two opposing teams chosen from rosters of players. Uh, they play on a standardized playing area, which is itself divided into an offensive zone, defensive zone, and goal zones with respect to each team. And the objective for each of these teams is to compete for the control and placement of an object of interest. In ice hockey, one team wants to gain possession of the puck, move it from its defensive zone into the offensive zone, and place it into the goal zone of its opposing team, all while preventing the same from happening to itself. Such sports are naturally episodic. So in hockey, you have this natural uh, length of time over which you play and evaluate play. It could be a 20-minute period, a 60-minute full game, or an entire season worth of games. The sort of data that you get from these games is highly stereotypical. It's typically very, very, very highly dimensional spatio-temporal data. And we obtain it in two forms. One is in the form of object trajectories. So these are the real-time dynamics for any object of interest in the games. What are the XY coordinates of the players, of the officials, of the puck? Uh, what are their velocities? What are the paths of the trajectories? So at any point in time, we want to know where everyone is. A bit more interesting for me would be something like the event log. This is the sequential log of state action events of interest. So hey, maybe five minutes into the game, there's a very interesting pass between two players. With this data, as I mentioned, what we really want to do is collect actionable insight in order to maximize an objective. We want our teams to win most of the time. And it follows the usual pathway. We want to describe what all the players are doing, how valuable they are. We want to be able to predict what our opponent's going to do. And we want to use that information in order to plan a response. <coughs> So now let's move on to the first stage of the pipeline, uh, data acquisition framed as computer uh, vision. I mentioned at the beginning that it's pretty hard to collect data because you can't really use specialized hardware, it's too costly, and you can't use manpower. It's also costly and it's just not adequate. Can we get around that? And it turns out pretty easily we can by turning to broadcast feeds. Why broadcast feeds? Well, they're cheap, they're plentiful, and they're easy to maintain mostly because the heavy side of the lifting is done by the broadcast media. The only downside to that is, now, is that now we're looking at parcel observations. You can't possibly see everything that's going on at every position on the rink. Uh, but what's nice about this is that if we're using broadcast feeds, we're now just looking at processing image and video data. And so this becomes an issue of applying computer vision tools. And these tools, are easily to apply and easy to uh, extend. So even if you're not looking at prod broadcast video, if you're an amateur, you can say, hey, dad, go up in the stands and take a, a video of me playing. We can possibly use the tools that are developed here. So what's the first stage in this pipeline in watching a game? It's camera self-calibration. In plain English, imagine you took your brain, ripped it from your head, and placed it in someone else's body. Okay, 
Your brain knows how to process visual information, but it would still have to adapt to the different physical characteristics of someone else's eyes. That, in a nutshell, is what self-camera -cali uh, calibration is. Mathematically, it's more or less learning parameter matrices using some linear algebra and some optimization. Uh, has anyone here ever played with OpenCV? Okay, so if you've done, if you've played with OpenCV, one of the first things you have to do is this camera calibration step. Uh, and, and the typical solution method you would use would be to take this checkerboard pattern, stand in front of your camera, and have it calibrate. And what I would love to see a man holding a checkerboard pattern at the beginning of every sports game, <laughs> it's just not going to happen. Right? So there are classical computer vision solutions that exist to handle this, uh, but they're expensive and they're brittle. So what I want to ask you is, can we do better? Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay, problem solved, end of talk. Yes, and can we do it in real time? Uh, so come up to me after the talk. <laughs> okay, so we've registered our camera, and now we want to kind of see what's going on and project it into a standardized template so that we can uh, do all sorts of nifty statistics on it. So what I want to do is label uh, every object on a 2D grid. So in hockey, it would be the uh, playing rink. I want to label it with the XY positions uh, and time coordinates of every player and object. Um, this is actually not that hard to do. Uh, deep convolutional neural networks are very good at detecting and placing bounding boxes over interesting regions. So you can just imagine uh, taking a little feature pattern in the form of a human player uh, and just moving it along the, the video frame and uh, pulling out human-like uh, subjects, it works pretty well. The only issues you might have is if you have something else that has a human form, like someone's shadow. So that will help you pull out uh, players, but you still want to identify and differentiate different players. You might notice if you ever watched a hockey game, it's pretty hard to actually see people's faces. So you can't use the usual method of like visual, visualization for facial matching. Uh, one idea is to use their jersey numbers. So this is the method we're currently working out. One of the difficulties that arises is underrepresentation in the data. Not all jersey numbers uh, appear in all games. Yeah, moreover, traject once, once you have location and, and, uh, and uh, IDs, you can glue this together using motion models to build trajectory paths. So conceptually, this isn't too hard to do. We have to take into account tricky edge cases, like what happens if two trajectories cross because of a collision? Usually at a collision point in a game, imagine two players just accidentally smashing into each other, picking themselves and moving on. There's a little bit of occlusion, so you, know, you might accidentally mislabel the continuing trajectories. Object tracking uh, and trajectory construction might seem like some, one, of the, one of those problems I said it's, it's really well done. Uh, but the difference between solving a problem to 99% and 100% is the difference between having something that's interesting from the research perspective and a viable product. So I really want you to think about how you could do that better. But let's assume that we have this done. So we've got camera calibration, we've got object tracking, what I'm interested now is in picking out interesting activities. So this is an area of computer vision called activity recognition. Uh, it's usually used for security purposes. We want to look at you know, behavior of someone who is lingering about and looks suspicious. It's much more general than what would be applied here. What we really care about is really just generating a fully annotated event log. So taking all that rich object tracking and trajectory data and being able to infer meaningful team sports action events. What sort of action events? Uh, human object, like one player has control of the puck. Human, human, one player is passing the puck from, uh, to another player. Uh, and group activities, like seeing uh, a group of members set up a particular defensive play. Uh, I'm not gonna say much more about this, it's a very uh, active area of research and therefore the most, uh, the, the least mature. Uh, but it's something we're looking into and if something that piques your interest, we'd love your help. But let's assume now for the next stage that, that that's been done. So we use computer vision methods to, to take video data from a game, 
we get our object trajectories, we get our fully annotated event logs. So we know a bit of context about what's happening, where and when. What we really want to do is tease out some semantic information from that event log. We want to be able to tell interesting stories. We want to be able to find new metrics that evaluate players, teams, their behaviors. And in the same manner, we want to be able to find new similarity measures to compare the same. We also want to be able to devise planning strategies for recruitment, composing lineups, um, making plays. You know, when I say tell an interesting story, if I have a metric that says someone like Carey Price is a good goaltender, that's not very valuable to me. Most people know that. He already has a high salary. If I can devise a metric that will be able to show me an equivalent valued player who's not as well known, and has a much lower salary, that is very valuable information for a team. So this is what the goal of machine learning data modeling is in team sports. One of the things that makes it particularly tricky is that we have to take into account something called explainable AI. Does anyone recognize the giant hulking fellow at the bottom of the screen? Yeah? Who is it? No. <laughs> Actually, wait. Yes, it is. You're right. <laughs> so that is ultimate fighting champion, or former ultimate fighting champion, Brock Lesnar. He's a big, giant, angry man. Now, uh, if you could just hear me from, from, for a moment, could you all raise your hand? Could, could everyone here just raise your hand? Come on up, reach high to the sky. Thank you, thank you. Now, keep your hands up if you would be willing to walk up to Brock Lesnar before a match and say, hey buddy, my neural network says that you can play better <laughs> if you change your fighting style this way. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And th the point I wanna make is that when it comes to safety critical systems, just being able to get something done isn't good enough. You have to be able to explain why something is good and why you should do it. It should be semant uh, semantically robust and open to interaction. This is an initiative that was proposed by DARPA. Uh, the general field is called Explainable AI. What it means for us formally is that Every step in that pipeline I've just mentioned and, and the one I'm gonna build has to be expressible in the semantics of the domain expert. And here our domain is team sports, so we really need the sports community to be comfortable with the stories that we tell and the tools we use to tell them. As an example, for those of you who are not familiar with, with hockey, there are two very simple stats that are used. One is called plus minus. For any player on the ice, every time something good happens while he's on the ice, he gets a little plus. Every time something bad happens on the ice, he gets a little minus. At the end of the game, you add up all the pluses and the minus, and if you're plus, you're considered a good player. Obviously, this sucks if you keep being on the ice with really bad teammates, right? So it's a very crude measure, but it's easy to understand. The players understand it, the players love it, the players use it. Slightly less crude is something called the Corsi statistic. It says, hey, it's not fair if I'm always on the ice with bad teammates. Let's add a little bit of context. It's actually just slightly less easy to understand. No one takes it seriously at all. So if you have the most perfect metric in the world, but you can't explain it in the terms that a sports person would understand, it's useless. Most of us are familiar with uh, reinforcement learning. You've probably seen a diagram like this, and what I like is that team sports modeling very naturally fits into it. Our base team uh, is the main agent. It acts with an environment which is absolutely everything else on the ice. Uh, the state is the score, the on-ice player dynamics, manpower. Uh, your actions are passing, shooting, or even choosing lineups of players on the ice. And the transi transitions come from player skill, uh, the natural stochastic dynamics, ice quality. If you choose a reward of one every time the base team wins, uh, scores a goal, and minus one every time the opposition scores, then it turns out that, that this can be interpreted as uh, an expected goal differential optimization problem. So the value function is very easily interpretable, and positive means the base team wins, and negative means the opposition wins. But there's a little caveat here in that you know, something we don't point out too much today is that what is optimal 
depends heavily on what we consider as our objective function. So for team sports games, for a particular team, what's the right objective? What's the right reward? Should we naturally model as episodic or infant horizon? And if it's an episode, what's the natural episode? Is it a 20 minute period, a full season? If we're using, modeling it using infinite horizon optimality, what's the meaning of the discount factor? The difficulty in use of a planning framework for descriptive purposes is the subjectivity. We need to focus on robust methods. Uh, and these you know, would be, you can imagine, extra theoretical constraints that come from the team sports domain. What's cool is the potential for what can happen in the future. Um, what I just showed you is a single agent reinforcement learning model, but you can easily see it as a hierarchical Markov game, where at the top level you have two teams competing in a zero sum game, one wins, one the other loses, but at the lower level you, it's, each team is composed of uh, a family of, of collaborative agents that each have their own intrinsic reward. And you can frame a number of different reinforcement learning issues in terms of team sports uh, vocabulary and become very meaningful. So with inverse reinforcement learning, you, you kind of figure out well, what is each player trying to optimize? With behavioral RL, what's the actual style? How do they actually play given what they're trying to optimize? Uh, and the most interesting thing for me is to consider multi-agent reinforcement learning abstractions. So if you look at state abstraction, you know, you find places in the rink where players uh, tend to behave the same, like a heat map, or social abstraction. So this, this is analogous to the notion of lineups in hockey. Uh, if you have two attacking players attacking a defensive player at the same time, those two attacking players can be viewed as one aggregate agent. And we'd like to put a value to that, to know how should we put certain combinations of players together. If you found anything that I kind of quickly rushed through interesting, uh, I encourage you to take a, a look at my slides. I will provide them online. Uh, and you can uh, get all of the details that you want. Lastly, I'd just like to say, please come join our team. Uh, we're looking for machine learning people, computer vision people, anyone who's interested in researching some very inter interesting multi-agent reinforcement learning problems. Uh, we have Bagel Fridays. And occasionally, we do fight the evil mutant terrorist, Magneto. Thank you. Thanks, Norm. So we, we have uh, time for one quick question while the next uh, speaker comes up and uh, sets up the, the laptop. Just a quick question. Uh, have you considered or are you using uh, simulations like video games? It seems like you could test a lot of your algorithms because you have a lot more grand truth, truth be it like the position of the players or the real stats of the players. So quick answer is yes. Uh, it's one of the few ways that you can simulate. But again, you have, you have some problems there. I mean, Mario has infinite many lives. He never gets tired. A real hockey player has the most two lives, you know. <laughs> so yes, you can, but again, it's the, 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 diff the subtle dif difficulty is the difference between being able to get something done and being able to describe what is good in a very robust way. Thank you. Let's thank the speaker again. And the next uh, contributed talk will be by uh, Samira Ibrahimi Kahu from uh, Microsoft Maluba uh, on figure Q&A, an annotated figure data set for visual reasoning. And this is a joint work with uh, other authors at Microsoft as well as uh, University of Montreal. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Samira Ibrahimi Kahu. Uh, I'm a researcher at Microsoft, and today I'm presenting Figure QA. It's an annotated figure data set for visual reasoning. This is a work uh, in collaboration with Adam, Vincent, Akosh, Adam, and Yasha. Uh, 
So this is an overview of the presentation. Uh, first, I talk about uh, what is visual reasoning and why is that important. Then uh, I talk about the problem of figure analysis. And uh, then I present our data set, which we call it figure QA, some experiments, and finally I summarize the talk. Uh, also on the right, you see some examples of our data set. Uh, so visual reasoning is a challenging task in computer vision. Uh, it's more complicated than object detection or uh, classification. Uh, and that's why there are a lot of recent research about that. Um, there, there are a lot of new data sets to, uh, to solve this task. Uh, the most popular one is Clever. Uh, Clever is, um, consists of 3D shapes, and uh, the questions are about uh, the location of the object, the color, the size. Uh, another very well-known data set is Guess What, from also from Mila, uh, which, is, uh, uh, the, which is based on a game. So there's a, a questioner and an oracle. Oracle knows the, uh, about the object, and questioner needs to ask enough questions to, to locate the object. And uh, finally, a very recent data set that's called NLVR. It's uh, 2D images, but, uh, qu uh, but the statements or the questions uh, have more variation because they're, uh, they're collected using crowdsourcing. Um, so we wanted to do a figure analysis. We, um, we noticed that the, the task is very similar to reasoning because given, a, given an example uh, image, let's say that's like a learning curve, you want to ask which model performs the best. So you need to compare the curves inside the image. Um, there has been a lot of recent work on that, uh, but as comes from the figure uh, analysis uh, community, uh, the first one is a query answering pipeline for figures which uh, consists of isolated components for figure retrieval, data extraction, and text recognition. Uh, another work is by Cliche Al, which presents a pipeline uh, using ConfNet for extracting data from scatter plots. And finally, the third work, which is recent also, is uh, uses CNN for uh, plot type classification and uh, data extraction. So all of this, uh, uh, all of these works extract all the, all the data from the figures. They, uh, they do uh, localization of access, values, and then they start reasoning about which model is the best. Uh, and one uh, weakness is that none of them has a model that is trained end-to-end. -end. And we wanted to focus uh, on reasoning tasks in isolation for, for our problem. Uh, that's why we came up with uh, with a data set, and uh, our claim is based on that, uh, that the understanding properties of interest in figures should not require inverting the whole uh, visualization pipeline. Also, many concepts can be understood intuitively, for example, smoothness, intersections, and uh, we often only look at the plot elements in a figure. We don't really uh, find every axis or its values. So to this end, we construct a corpus of synthetic figures with uh, relational questions. And uh, finally, we show some experiments to, to support our claim that the models that are learning relational features are performing better for, for this task. So our data set is called Figure QA. It has over 100K of plots, over 1 million of questions with answers of yes and no. And uh, overall, we have 15 types of questions. Uh, they can be, uh, uh, they can compare one to one, for example, whether the, the bar plot, all I've, uh, sorry, whether uh, all I've intersects uh, blue or uh, one to all, whether gray is the smoothest. Uh, and our plot elements are identified by colors. We have 100 unique color names. Uh, in total, we have five different types of plots. Uh, the first one is vertical bar plot. And uh, as you see some example of questions is that whether uh, blue is less than aqua or uh, whether one of them is the high median. 
We also have horizontal bar plots. And uh, again, some example of questions of uh, which one is greater, which one is less than the other one. Uh, the third type of plot we have is uh, line plots. And for line plots, we, uh, we have curves varying from uh, 2 to 7. And uh, we have more challenging questions about roughness, smoothness, or uh, area under the curve. So we ask questions about whether curve blue has more uh, area under the curve than the curve red. And, uh, and, the, uh, and the curves we have are uh, maximum polynomial degree 2. So we also have dot line plots, which are similar to curve plots. It's just we don't, uh, we don't have the line segments. Finally, we have pie charts. For pie charts, we, the questions are similar to uh, bar plots. So this is like um, an overview of the question of the all question types we have. For bar and uh, pie charts, we ask uh, whether one uh, color is maximum or min minimum, or whether it's low median or high median. And uh, we also compare two different uh, bar, whether it, it's less than the other one or greater. Then some examples for, for line ones is that whether x intersect with y. Um, so we also provide uh, additional annotation. We think that is important because uh, in future, if we want to come up with a better model that uses attention, or we want to do multitask learning, these kind of annotations are important. So we provide bounding boxes for all plot elements. That includes uh, segments, labels, uh, pie slices, uh, and all the data values and uh, also tick values, uh, whatever we use to to generate these plots. Here is some example of the bounding boxes. Um, we even have bounding boxes for legends. And for each uh, line segment, we also provide bounding boxes with our data set. Uh, so we, uh, we design an experimental protocol, which is uh, inspired by Clever. Uh, so we wanted the models that are performed well and clever also be, uh, can be easily used as baseline on our data set. So uh, what Clever does for experimental protocol is that they uh, divide their color set into set one and two. And uh, they use set A for, for some of their shapes and um, in our case figures. And we use uh, set B for the other shapes. And uh, scheme two is is the reverse of set A and B. This is important because we want to, when we train the model, we want to see all the colors, but we want to also see whether we generalize well on the test set. So in all the experiments that we have, we use a train from scheme one, validation and test from scheme two, but we have all of this uh, online if you want to download. Uh, so for experiments, uh, we have three neural network architectures. Uh, the first one is text only. It's just an LSTM and word embeddings. The second one has additional CNN features of the image. And finally, we have uh, a recent model uh, that's called relation networks, which includes relational uh, features. So this is our text only baseline. Uh, as an input to LSTM, we feed a, a <coughs> word embedding of size 64. And then we uh, feed the question embedding to MLP, and then a class MLP is the classifier of yes and no. This baseline is important because we want to see how much the visual modality uh, is important and how much we can learn from that apart from the questions. Uh, then we have a CNN plus LSTM baseline. Uh, this baseline, uh, for we have five layers of continents, and then a fully connected, and then we concatenate the, uh, the hidden states of LSTM to, uh, to the last layer, and then again an MLP classifier which uh, classifies yes or no as the answer. Uh, finally, the 
The most complicated <coughs> model is the relation network from DeepMind. Uh, relation network has a uh, has an LSTM similar to, to the one we used in the other uh, experiments, but it has a count net uh, which they uh, treat every pixel over the channel of the count net as an object. And then they built this matrix that uh, represents the relation between each two objects. And they also encode the positions and then concatenate the, um, the, work, the LSTM uh, hidden state. And then the whole uh, batch is fit to an MLP and then averaged and then again another classifier that outputs yes or no. Uh, so this baseline uh, used to be state of the art and, and clever. There's another uh, uh, method called conditional, based on conditional batch norm. That's something we want to try after this. Um, so this is our initial results on our uh, scheme two, our uh, text only, uh, only, only like uh, learns the chance. The CNN can learn a slightly more and then RN performs way better than the other one. Um, so finally to summarize and say, what are the next step? We showed uh, a model, uh, we showed that for, for our reasoning about a uh, figure, especially for our data set, models that uh, learn relational reasoning can perform better. Uh, we also, in future, plan to extend our data set with uh, more, more questions uh, via crowdsourcing. And uh, we want to increase the variation inside our plots. And uh, we will have more experiments coming. They're, they're training right now. And um, uh, thank you for for listening. If you want to download the data set, it's, uh, uh, it's available on dataset.meluba.com. You can also get a USB with our data set if you come to booth in, in the evening. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Samira. So uh, we, we, we do have quite some time for questions. Hi. Thanks. Interesting stuff. Um, so quick question. Did you were generating the plots yourself synthetically? For yes. those experiments, have yeah. you looked at what happens if you go to like just a plot in the wild and what the performance would be? Uh, we didn't try that, but okay. uh, even when we generated synthetically, we we found the problem very challenging. Uh huh. Is, so is there are there certain cases that are hard to go across, like change, like I imagine font changes that you can somewhat deal with, but is there what are, what are the what's the nature of some of these challenges? Uh, so th the first problem we had uh, was that there's not enough data that comes with uh, enough annotation or questions about the figures. Uh, there, there are some related work. They, they crawled, for example, uh, archive or something, but they, they, their task is only to get uh, the values. We wanted to, to answer some questions about that. So that's like a future work. We want to show that if we train something on our data set, it can actually answer on, on real world data. I do have one question. So, so right now, um, the the labels on the plot, uh, the legend, every written information you just feed into the CNN. Do you do you make use of it or feed into an LSTM somehow, or that's that's uh, just part of the of the CNN input? That's that's another experiment we want to do. Right now, we only give the visual image. We don't use the bounding boxes, but those are also available that we want to do. If you want to use, for example, some attention model, we, we can use these bounding boxes. Claude, uh, you should go to the, no, 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 you, you need to go to the mic, sorry. It's for the, the streaming. And then there is one question there. Yeah, please. Um, hey, um, I may have missed something, but when you, when you just feed the LSTM, you just feed the question, and you, you, you're not looking at the, uh, the plot at all? Uh, the, the protocol is just for, for having, for, for comparing, but LSTM only, only gets the question. Okay, and, so then, and then we concatenate the output of LSTM 
to our plant map features. And so the result that you were getting was slightly less 50% and with the CNN it was slightly more than 50%? Yeah, so the, right. first, the first one is text only, doesn't even see the images. So given this is a binary classification problem at the end, uh, I was wondering uh, what is the percentage, like what's the distribution of the yes-no answers? It's 50-50. Okay. The data set is, uh, is balanced inside the plot type and so like there are 50% yes, 50% no. All right. Yes, Claude. Uh, this is my, my question to have the, the results. <laughs> okay, thank you. Maybe one last question? Uh, yes, um, uh, for the ConvNet, um, would, do, you, do you have any idea like what types of features it's picking up on? Um, so how, how will you, you tell um, if it's learning the, the things that you wanted to learn about, about the question, right? Or could be picking up something, some other, I, 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 like for the area under the curve, for example. Um, well, what features is it looking at for that? Uh, uh, do you mean what? Uh, like what um, visual features in, in, uh, is, it, is it learning um, for, for the, for the ConvNet uh, part of your pipeline? So we just looked into the to our filters, but uh, we need to more more statistical, I would say, analysis of how they perform. But uh, we think that the the simple continent plus LSTM just doesn't do that well. With like 52 percent is not is nothing that definitely doesn't learn area under the curve. I would say. Thanks. Let's thank uh, Samira again. And the last uh, contributed talk uh, before lunch uh, is by Ethan Perez, who's going to tell us about film visual reasoning with a general conditioning layer. Uh, this is a joint work with uh, a bunch of other co-authors uh, at uh, Mila and uh, University uh, de Lille. Hey everyone, I'm Ethan Perez. I'm really, really excited to give this talk today. Uh, from my completely unbiased perspective, I think visual reasoning is one of the most exciting areas in deep learning, uh, reasoning in general, and I hope that I can convince you this as well. Um, so to motivate, uh, here's an example from the data set that we were working with. And the question is, what number of cylinders are small purple things or yellow rubber things? So I'll give you a few seconds to think How many of you guys think the answer is rubber? No, I'm kidding. Uh, one, two, three, okay, it's two. So this amounts to, you know, you find which cylinders are there, you find which ones are small and purple, or which ones are yellow and rubber, and you count these up, and it's the two ones in the back. And another example, uh, is the color of the shiny thing that's to the left of the small sand rubber thing the same as the big object that's right of the large cylinder? Uh, I mean, these are the sorts of ridiculous questions that are in the data set. But you can see, I mean, if you took, you know, like a minute, <laughs> you could get the answer um, that it's no. But, uh, uh, but you can see, like, you have to really be able to relate very, like, very easily across different portions of the image. Um, and it requires some under some more fundamental understanding. Um, yeah, and so that kind of gets to the motivation. So what, like, why reasoning? Why is reasoning important? Uh, and I think it's really the ability to get from some low level pieces of information to some higher level understanding, um, whether that's knowing what poker, uh, what poker cards are on the table to understanding what the best action is or getting from pixels to understanding how two objects compare like, it's really the idea of like extracting some just like high level piece of information in a coherent way. And, and the other thing is that it's challenging. So it's actually really challenging for current models. Uh, when you just throw a deep learning model at, at just a standard one at this kind of problem, then it tends to actually miss the underlying structure just because there's so much, as you saw in that last question. Um, and so they just tend to exploit biases. So just answering like two for every counting question, for example. Uh, but then on the other hand, you have um, people who have seen this problem and they've just, uh, 
to counteract this, this, they've built in the reasoning. So they've used some uh, aspects of what we think reasoning should include and built it into the model. And these models work great, but they're not really what we would want to do uh, ideally. And so I'll just briefly go through uh, a tour of these models. But um, first, let's go through the data set. So it's just a synthesized data set, um, 700K training samples, uh, referenced in the previous talk, actually. and um, yeah, there's image questions, answers, um, and there's also an extra, extra supervisory signal that's not too important um, for this talk. But the basic approach would be to just extract image features um, with some ConfNet, extract question feature features with an LSTM, um, and then combine these two. Uh, and you can just put an MLP. Um, and another approach is to, well, maybe the question information can tell me where I should look on this image. Um, and so you can use a spatial attention approach and then run the rest through an MLP. Uh, and then an even more uh, recent approach is to iteratively refine the attention that uh, you can get from the question in the, uh, question in the image. And in this way, maybe you can refine, get to maybe where the object in question is and use that to make a prediction. And it's been shown that these option, uh, all of these models um, fail on this multi-step reasoning task precisely because they miss the underlying structure and exploit biases. And now then we have models on the other hand which explicitly build in reasoning. And, and um, you can see this example here where um, you have a model that uh, builds in modularity. So you have different um, mini neural networks, you can think of them like two layers each, that just are assembled in a question-dependent manner, and each of these specialize on something like color, finding the color of something, finding uh, counting objects, finding the shape, comparing, and it makes sense that you know reasoning um, it requires the same functions, but you're just using them in different ways, and th this is kind of an intuitive way to build in reasoning into a model. And there's another approach, end-to-end -end module networks, which also does this. Um, and then on the other hand, you have like other ways to build in reasoning, such as relation networks, which were discussed previously. Um, and these essentially use our, our prior that reasoning requires understanding relationships. And so you, then you can build in these pairwise comparisons into your model over image features, as you can see. Um, and then you know, use an MLP to do that uh, comparison, and then another MLP to predict the final answer. Um, but there's, the details aren't that important, except that you're building in uh, reasoning. Um, and this is kind of. Uh, this is kind of, they, they work really well. They work re remarkably well. Um, but the thing is that that's just the thing that we wanted to learn. And if we could learn reasoning um, for this setting, then we might be able to learn even more complicated or more freeform reasoning that doesn't come from just these uh, like generated questions that have more structure. It could just extend to a lot more. Um, yeah, so, so we, we built off of prior work uh, in conditional batch norm and developed this layer that we call film feature-wise linear modulation. And it's, it's very straightforward. So essentially, it's just um, a per-feature scaling and shifting that's dependent on some conditioning information. And in this case, our conditioning information is going to be our question. And you, you're, you take the question information, convert it into a scaling and shift for each feature map or feature if you just have a normal neural network. And it just changes how these features are used, essentially. And here's a, here's a visualization. Um, and it, it gives you a sense of how, really how like granular and powerful this can be. So you can, for example, this, there's a negative gamma here. It flips the entire feature map. And then you have a, a positive uh, bias, and it shifts it. And you can see the resultant feature map is pretty different. And this happens at each feature. Um, and, and it kind of motivates for me uh, the name, the acronym that we came, uh, or actually acronym creator.net came up with. Uh, and it's like if you apply a film to an image, then it really, it's the same image, but it highlights different features. And this allows you to, to see different things in the image. And so by, by doing this, our, our thinking was that we might be able to reason in different ways by applying different films that are dependent on a question. So this is the film-based model that we built for reasoning. And here, the question information is processed by our current net and gets converted into uh, film parameters, and these film parameters um, then fill the film layers that are in a convolutional neural network. So you have um, the same processing that's going through the convolutional neural, neural network, but just by changing how these features are used, 
then you um, maybe can get some interesting things to happen. And actually, the crazy thing is that this works. Uh, it, it works and it's state of the art. And you know, we, we didn't build in reason. Like nothing about that model really screams reasoning. It, it, you're, you're, you're just changing how the features are used, essentially. Um, and yeah, my, my co-author and I, so the relation networks um, are at 95.5% and we're at 97.5%. Uh, and so my co-author and I like to joke that we got super deep mind results. Um, so that models from deep mind, um, which is pretty hard nowadays. Uh, so, so then the, the next question is, well, does this, I mean, does it actually reason? Is it cheating somehow? It, it doesn't feel like, you know, necessarily obvious that, think that this model is doing the right thing. Um, so we, we plotted a TSNI of the parameters, the film parameters, in the first and the last layers to get an idea of how they're operating differently if they are. And you can see really cool things emerge. Like, um, you see that uh, if you look at the, on the left side, the clusters eight and six, so these are question categories. Those are query color and equal color question categories. So it's grouped on color. 11 and five, you see query size, equal size, grouped on size. Uh, seven and 10, query shape, equal shape, grouped on shape. So it's really grouped on the low level thing that you're looking for um, in the question. And then on the other end, we have 11, 10, 12, equal shape, equal size, equal material. Um, four, five, six, seven, query, just essentially like query categories. So now it's grouped on the high level thing. And that's exactly what we'd expect reasoning to do, is to first, you might need to look at the colors of the thing, and then you might need to, uh, let, let's say, compare these or do some high-level operation, and it's just learned this end-to-end. -end. Um, and, and I think this is even like, more remarkable, is that category nine here in the high-level film parameters is equal integer, and it's just between um, comparing numbers and, com uh, and checking equality of, let's say, like sizes, shapes, materials, numbers. And it's, it's kind of what we would expect, the high level function for this somewhere in between, um, and it's just learned this end to end. So then getting more intuition, so uh, the film parameters, the scaling uh, factors are actually, a lot of them are zero, which shows that just a lot of these features are just getting shut off because they're, let's say, irrelevant or they're getting quieted, while others are really being on the, or on the magnitude of, uh, let's say, 10, are being upregulated and, and used a lot. And then, um, the beta values as well are mostly negative. We have a ReLU in our architecture, which means that a lot of the activations are getting shifted so that they don't pass the ReLU. Um, and then we have a lot of numbers, ablation studies that we run. The important thing is that like, all of these are above 90. Uh, pretty much we weren't able to find any sort of like, moving around of the, the film layer or even taking away uh, scaling, taking away shifting. Like these things, the architecture is still able to learn, so it's quite robust, um, at least in this setting. Um, and then we, we tested, so how well does this generalize to more uh, difficult questions? So human posed questions. Uh, and you can see the example here, which shape objects are partially obscured from view? And these, these concepts of like partially and obscured, these are not um, in the original Clever data set, but, we won't, but um, this data set was developed to see, can a Clever model, uh, Clever trained model, extend to these more difficult questions either before or after fine tuning? Um, so there's new vocab, new concepts, um, and yeah, and so this is actually like a correct answer from our model um, on this question uh, after fine tuning, and you can see another example. So what object is the color of grass? Well, yeah, it's learned that grass is green from the questions that it's trained on, but the in interesting thing here is that actually it, it's never, uh, the question doesn't ask for a specific trait, but the model has learned that uh, humans preferred to identify objects with their shape. So it didn't answer uh, green, it didn't answer large, it answered cylinder, and this is something that it's picked up. Um, what objects, uh, what color is the matte object farthest to the right? Farthest, it's superlative, it's actually like quite complex, and it's also picked up this concept as well. Um, what shape is reflecting in the large, large cube? That's kind of cool as well, it's picked this up. Um, but then it hasn't picked up other things that, that are also quite difficult, such as hypothetical. So if all the cubicle objects were removed, what shaped objects would there be most of? And it, it doesn't learn to do this sort of thing. So there's still room to go. Um, but even, and actually Clever Humans is actually quite small, so it's just 18K samples. But it, it, it's pretty interesting that it's able to pick up these sorts of concepts to some extent. So yeah, so just some numbers. It's, it's also state of the art here. 
Um, oh, the in interesting thing about here is that the other model, the program generation execution engine, explicitly builds in um, modules um, and that that kind of, for these kind of questions which are more freeform or which require reasoning that doesn't necessarily fit into this neat tree-like structure like farthest, for example, um, you can kind of see why just having an open-ended, like more prior free kind of method is beneficial because it can learn to, it doesn't have a structure restricting it to a specific type of uh, like way of reasoning. Um, and then this is like one of my favorite results. So um, with that, uh, the previous talk mentioned how there's this like a split of clever where some uh, objects don't have some of the colors and some, some shapes don't have some of the colors um, and so on. And so we trained on a, a data set that doesn't have uh, a split of clever that doesn't have blue cylinders. Um, and the idea is like, well, we've seen blue cubes and, and blue spheres, so we kind of want to understand that blue itself is a separate concept from shape. Um, but this is pretty difficult because usually, like maybe if you train on a data, data set that doesn't have blue cylinders, your model will learn um, a bias. And our model actually does learn a bias that cylinders are never blue, and so it will all, if you ask it to count the number of blue cylinders, it will always answer zero, for example. Um, but we found that we can actually get around this by, so, so word embeddings, there's, in word embeddings there's this really uh, neat notion that you can do linear manipulations and that these make sense. So you can do king minus man plus woman equals queen. And uh, like these are the sorts of relationships that you actually get emerging from word embeddings. And so we try this with our model and we're actually able to get our, with these questions that are up here, and we're actually able to get our model to answer um, questions on blue cylinders, which it's never seen before. Uh, which I think, to me, it really gets at something core, uh, which is in reasoning, which is being able to understand things that you haven't seen before. So yeah, there, there's a ton of related work. The broader category of this is, is visual question answering, uh, just answering diverse questions. You can see there's all sorts of things. Um, up here, which, which many people work on. And this uh, method that uh, film builds off of conditional batch norm um, has been shown to work on this setting. Um, conditional instance norm uh, is also a related uh, work, and that's been shown to work on style transfer. And the way that that works is you condition on a style, and then you just put these parameters into a network which transfers um, the style on a target image. Um, and yeah, and so traditionally, like the, this method was thought to be connected with normalization, um, but we kind of showed that it works anywhere you put it. Um, that's kind of the connection between these methods and our method. Um, so yeah, a summary is that uh, it's, it's highly effective, modulates features in actually like a meaningful way, um, pretty robust, generalizes well, efficient. Um, it's just a few number of parameters per layer, and and it reasons without a strong prior. So future work, um, now that we, we kind of have decoupled it from normalization, there, there are some interesting ways to apply it to recurrent settings, to reinforcement learning, um, where there's a lot less normalization that usually happens. Um, investigating the film parameters, so the fact that you can get these word embedding style manipulations um, is really interesting, and we kind of find interesting properties where if you interpolate between um, the film parameters of two questions, you get answers that are also interpolated between, their, so let's say between like two and six, if that's the right answer for the endpoints. Um, maybe you can improve zero-shot generalization if you actually train the model to do zero-shot generalization. Um, and there's interesting links with like conditional computation since you're getting a lot of feature maps that are zeroed out, um, which might be interesting from a theory perspective. So thanks. And we do have uh, a couple of minutes for a question. I uh, understand that everyone's is, is hungry, but uh, I'm sure that uh, Ethan would be pleased to answer. Please go to the microphone for a question. I just want to ask, uh, actually this question is well valid for the previous one. In terms of, these questions actually are, in terms for the reasoning, are already set before. So they are actually a preset of questions that have been done in the reasoning process but would that be possible to include in the reasoning? You are expecting in, the, in this process as well to include, maybe expecting as well to get um, questions themselves part of the reasoning instead of asking questions prior to the uh, process. 
I don't know if I get it clear. Uh, so are you asking if the questions in the test set have been seen before? Uh, something like that, yeah. Just so, yeah, so the way that this data set ma is made is particularly so that you have to, like the particular questions in the test set haven't been seen before, but you know, their subcomponents are. So you have to be able to recognize like the concepts of color in comparison, but compose these in new ways um, and like manipulate the feature maps or organize the modules in different ways that you've never done before, but that might make sense to you based on how you did it in the training process. I mean, I just to the question you asked before at, at the beginning, yeah, actually, yeah. I really state that, okay, we have actually have, we saw those, uh, I mean, figures you showed to us and then you ask us to see, I mean, so we have actually a priori, we have some question we, a priori before, and then based on that, so there is in the reasoning actually as well this a priori, and then after that comes a posteriori. Uh, so in the reasoning as a whole, it includes as well a priori, and that's why I was asking this question. To be complete, I think. Okay. okay. No more questions, so let's thank uh, Ethan again. Okay, it's time to break for lunch. Uh, lunch is a part of the symposium. It's served on the first floor, so you need to go down a couple of flights of escalator. There are signs. We reconvene at 1.30 sharp, so we have uh, just a little less than an hour and a half for lunch.